Hello, everyone. <clears throat> How are you doing? I would like to thank you for joining me, of course. Um, it seems like uh, World War III is in the air, and that is worth talking about. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about this today. I, I think there are some interesting fault lines here. Um, because the world is going up in flames, as it were. I think we all feel like the there's an intensity to many of these conflicts. There's an ir, ir, irresolvable quality to these conflicts, which again is almost the the definition of a, a cause of war. There's an irre, irreconcilable difference. You can't resolve this problem through any other means, and thus the guns come out. And people get killed, and territory gets, territory changes hands, etc. Um, but I, I do think there's some interesting fault lines because I do think all of these things are connected. They're connected, obviously, in the way that the world is connected today, um, through the internet and travel and much else. Uh, through the ability to see a war crime almost as it happens on social media, that is extremely remarkable. Also to see disinformation from war in real time. War, disinformation during wartime is obviously not a new thing in the slightest bit, but it can be amplified and can just occur at a much faster pace than it previously did. Uh, but I think there's some interesting fault lines, and I, I set those out in a tweet that I published, and I, uh, I'll just walk through the way that I see it. So I'm trying to be objective here. I'm, I'm not, you know, it's funny. If anything, I sympathize with the World War woke side of things. Uh, <laughs> so make of that what you will. But I'm trying not to... Uh, you know, take a side or, or be morally self-righteous about any of this stuff. I, I think you, you always try to analyze things. So the other day, Mitch McConnell, who apparently is still alive, uh, the senator from Kentucky, he announced a new axis of evil. Now, this was just a blast from the past. This was like listening to a Green Day album or something. It, it just brought me back. Uh, to uh, high school, or I guess technically to when I had just graduated from college. Uh, and the, uh, the old axis of evil was not Russia at all, in fact. Um, Vladimir Putin worked well with George W. Bush. George W. Bush looked into his heart and so on. Vladimir Putin suggested that his war against Chechnya, which he was executing with a great deal of ferocity, uh, was part of the war on terror, et cetera. So the original axis was um, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. Now, um, that term was actually coined by David Frum. I believe this is true. And his wife leaked that to some of her friends or something, and so it kind of got out. But David Frum was a George W. Bush speechwriter, and it makes sense he, uh, along with David Pearl, wrote a book called An End to Evil. So he was super self-righteous, super messianic, you could say. It, it was about bringing an end to evil in the world. And um, that was very much of the era. Access is also a, uh, uh, an important part of that formulation in the sense that it ev evokes the Second World War and um, the Axis powers led by Germany, etc. So we're going back to this war on Hitler. And we, of course, you know, throughout the W era, we would hear all of this talk of, you know, Chamberlain and Munich and uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, it actually got extremely tiresome. Um, you don't hear much of that anymore. You hear it sometimes, but more muted. Anyway. The notion that you could connect North Korea, Iran, and Iraq was rather bizarre. And also the notion that you could connect Iraq with 9-11 was tenuous at best. Um, Saddam was also someone who was a sometime ally 
of the United States. Um, apparently, he thought that he was going to get away with an invasion of Kuwait um, in 1991 because a diplomat had told him that the U.S. won't have an opinion on this matter or something like that. He saw that, understandably, as a green light. Uh, but no, the, you know, if you want to look to who might have funded 9-11, uh, you have to look at some of these entities that are actually U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia, etc. The, they weren't invaded. Um, Iran was part of that list. Iran is a longtime um, boogeyman, certainly an adversary of Israel. It all kind of fit. And then North Korea, you have this like evocation of the Cold War. It's Stalinism that's still around. Just throw them in for good measure. Now, um, you have a fault line that I guess in a way makes a little more sense, although is still tenuous. Um, the, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia certainly evoked a lot of the emotions of the Cold War. It seemed like we were back in that type of thinking. And in a way, we had left all the terror war thinking behind. The, you know, spreading democracy and ending evil and supporting Israel and oil in the Middle East, that, that was kind of gone. And instead, it was the harder, you know, spy craft and espionage and, 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 and darkness, but, but also kind of clarity in a way of the Cold War. Um, and yeah, it was it was back on. I mean, tensions between the United States and Russia were worse than they were between, say, the United States and the Soviet Union uh, during uh, most of the 1980s. Um, so that makes sense. Um, whether you're going to connect Iran and Hamas with Russia is interesting. A little bit tenuous. There is some connection there. So. Hamas did did visit Moscow not too long ago, so there there is a certain degree of uh, uh, a recognition, uh, if not support. Um, Russia has been kind of moving towards the the second world, if you will, in terms of allies with Iran, uh, etc. One of the interesting dynamics that we'll often forget that was present in the um, beginning of the Trump administration was this outreach to Russia as an attempt to turn them on Iran. So a lot of people, and I can remember the alt-right days, and I can remember a lot of realist type people, paleoconservatives getting excited about Trump, and the notion is, finally, we're not going to be at war with Russia. And after all, um, Barack Obama himself told Mitt Romney, you know, hey, Grandpa, the Cold War is over. We can work with Russia. Hillary Clinton offered Russia the reset button. So the, it, it wasn't as if an outreach to Russia was some totally implausible thing, or, and it wasn't as if it were t some right-wing fanatical thing. So um, we all focused on this you know, rapprochement or, or new, the sunshine initiative towards Russia. What we didn't see was this other matter. And you can understand the details of that by looking to the Seychelles Islands episode that happened before Trump went into office. There was an emissary of Trump. Um, there was, seemed to imply that um, someone from Blackwater or X or the Prince family were involved. There was emissaries from Putin. There's emissaries from the Middle East. And they were hatching a plan to, in effect, turn Russia on Iran. So they, the, the idea was, you know, you, Russia, we'll be nice to you now. We'll lay off the pussy riot stuff. We'll lay off the cultural Cold War that's going on. We'll lift the sanctions but you break away from Iran and work with us. That was the deal. And again, I think a lot of people in right-wing circles who were supportive of Trump at the time 
fixated on that Russia thing and they missed the, the rest of it, which was that Donald Trump was imminently hostile towards Iran. He wanted to break the deal from Iran immediately. And then he was also a Likudnik at heart. He moved, um, we recognize the, uh, the capital of Israel and Jerusalem. It's largely symbolic, uh, but that is obviously a uh, very bold move. Um, recognize the Golan Heights. Um, the, uh, the person who was actually an ambassador to Israel was someone working in funding settlements in the West Bank. I mean, I, I could go on and on. Basically, Israel got so much of what it wanted, if not everything, uh, so much. Uh, and so that was a key aspect to all this. So anyway, I'm rambling here a little bit, but let me let me get back on track. So um, whatever might have been possible five or six years ago, this is now the fault line. Russia and Iran are on the same side. They are opposed to the West as, you know, the great Satan that includes Israel, also includes the United States as a, as a force of Westernization and a supporter of Zionism. And they're on the same team. Um, very interesting. So this axis of evil connects Ukraine and Hamas slash Israel. Those things aren't directly related, but you know, there's some there there. There's a better connection between Iran and Russia than there is between, say, you know, North Korea and Iraq or something. Um, the other thing that I've noticed that I think is worth talking about is what I called World War Woke. And what I'm referring to here is not necessarily the security state, but the educated, professional, managerial class, people with uh, Apple laptops, people who work in a bureaucracy of a corporation or the government, people who might work on Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know who I'm talking about. And these people, they've gone in for woke. They've gone in for uh, critical race theory. They've, I think they're represented well by Gavin Newsom or something. So where are their sentiments? Because so much of how they define themselves actually is about political correctness and being on the right side of history, et cetera. And they absolutely sympathize with Ukraine. Uh, a longstanding joke uh, from the right wing is that, you know, you have a Ukraine flag and in your bio and you suddenly care about this country yada, yada, yada. Uh, so they had sympathies with Ukraine. They also sympathized with Israel after the events of October 7th, as, you know, we all did. It was uh, terrifying stuff. But the thing is, things change. And I have noted, the, noted this trend for some time. 25 years ago, uh, when I was just becoming an adult, I was in college or just out, the idea of the mainstream media broaching any sort of criticism of Israel was all but a th unthinkable. I mean, you would get some around the edges. There would be some hand-wringing about, you know, uh, settlers in the West Bank or et cetera. But things have changed. And now I would say that criticism of Israel and even criticism of the legitimacy of Israel is something that is palatable on MSNBC, uh, CNN, certainly not Fox News, but it is very mainstream. Even the New York Times, which, I mean, I, and again, I'm not saying this is some kind of criticism even or, or some conspiracy theory. There, Let's just say that the New York Times is uh, a... a uh, heavily influenced Jewish, you know, institution. You see a lot of criticism of Israel there. So things change. And Israel is in a different space than it is now, even among Jews, and actually kind of especially among Jews, in fact. Uh, someone like John Stewart, who, from what I can tell, and I, I don't always like John Stewart, but he 
you know, when I remember being in right wing circles, you would hear things like, oh, his name is John Leibowitz and, you know, he's probably a secret Zionist or he's a liar or whatever. You know, I don't buy that, actually. If you <laughs> – I think he's genuinely quite critical of Israel, actually. And he does not ha – he does not see Zionism as a important component of his identity. I think that's true and that's real. And actually, he's representative of quite a few of American, say, liberal Jews who are critical of Israel, much more critical of Israel than whites, in fact. One of the most curious things is that um, – Whites are more – evangelical Christian whites are more Zionist than the Jews themselves. Uh, they have a extremely warm perception of Jews in general, whereas Jews don't have a warm perception of evangelical whites. They have a, a negative perception of them, in fact. Weird asymmetry, lots of biblical end-time stuff is wrapped up in that. A lot of things are wrapped up in that, but it's real and it's true. Uh, so anyway, I'm rambling as usual, but I, I'm trying to get all these things out there. There are a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, the other thing is that there is the MAGA religious right component. These people are fiercely pro-Israel. They love everything that Trump did. They only wish that he would have actually destroyed Iran. Uh, they, Israel has carte blanche. I mean, Israel had carte blanche a year ago. They certainly have carte blanche for these people after October 7th. Do what you will. Uh, the Palestinians are evil. Muslims kill them all. What have you. So, but the big difference in the MAGA people, and this is something that I never expected to see, is that they have become, to a very large extent, pro-Russia. So they see Russia as a bastion of, you know, Christianity, et cetera, and um, it's trad as opposed to the evil West. I mean, they, they've, they've taken on a totally new posture. And so we have this interesting dynamic between the professional managerial class, World War woke, and the uh, MAGA religious right, I forgot what I called them, uh, MAGATARDS. Uh, they each are kind of taking different sides. World War Woke sympathizes with the Palestinians. They are totally behind Ukraine. Uh, Magaville is sympathetic towards Russia. I mean, they want to dump Ukraine, and they are totally fiercely behind Israel. So we have this, like, polarized, split country. Now, as I wrote in my tweet, I do think that the security state is ultimately going to define this thing. And if there is a world war, for better and for worse, in many ways, you know, going against my own personal um, perspective on the matter or inclinations, I am inclined towards Ukraine. I'm also inclined, I'm very, not necessarily inclined towards the Palestinians, but I'm very skeptical of Israel. But what I, my own personal opinion, in a way, doesn't matter. There is going to be a kind of east-west divide in this conflict. W the wokesters, the, the managers, and the magatards are going to be caught on opposite ends of this. And it's going to be the west defined by the United States, Israel, uh, western and central Europe. The east is going to be Russia, Iran, and Hamas, if you want to count them as a... Uh, as a world player in this matter. All right. That was a good 20 minute rant. And we have 282 people. Wow. I'm very happy about that. I'm humbled by it. Um, I have let some people in. So if you would like to ask a question or speak your piece, you are more than welcome. I will go to. Oh, wow. Okay. Groip Gang AF. America first. All right. I, I have... <laughs> if you're just here to uh, do the cheeseburger meme, I'm afraid I will eject you. <laughs> but if you would like to say something, then uh, have at it, my man. I just, uh, just want to say, is there a reunion with Nick Fuentes on the horizon? A reunion with Nick Fuentes? Um 
Well, uh, yeah, now, you know, I, um, Nick, I, I've, I've gained a, <clears throat> I think Nick and I just disagree on some fundamental things. And um, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, overlook any, you know, past hostilities. Uh, holding grudges doesn't really pay off. Um, I think we, we were kind of on different sides of things. Um, I would say this. I, uh, I appreciate his just kind of outrageous and outlandish takes. I, I kind of understand him, I, I think, as well. I, I think there's a lot of... Uh, behind all the irony, I think there's some sincerity and a little bit of desperation as well. So I, I kind of, you know... I have a nuanced take on Nick, but I don't. I don't think Nick and I will ever be, you know, uh, on some team. I, I just think we have a we have really radically different worldviews. Well, just just remember that you are the Godfather, and you are always welcome back. Oh, I appreciate it. Yes, I am the Godfather. I like being the Godfather. I could just whack all my enemies, right? <laughs> right. Uh, maybe not the Godfather in that sense. Thank you. All right, um, Sean Surfgood, you are up. Sean, I think you have to unmute yourself. Sean? All right. Uh, Charlie, you are up. Uh, I kind of just want to throw a little bit of water on the idea that like Zionism and Christianity are inherently linked. And I'd kind of use like India as a good example of like why it's national interest as opposed to like religious interest. I mean, like India is as passionately Zionist as America and it's like 0% Christian. Um, I, I think like the American Zionism is just a result of like World War II and the kind of savior complex of uh, beating the Germans. Uh, that's, where, that's where I think it comes from. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you... You can't separate Zionism from the Bible. And, uh, you know, I mean, it is the promised land of Canaan. And I, would, and I would stress that it's all of it. It's all of, you know, Judea and Samaria, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't deny, like, you can't um, separate the, you know, the First Testament, the Old Testament of, like, from from the, that being like the Jews' promised land. I mean, I think that's pretty uh, obvious, but the idea, like, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this a million times, so you might just roll your eyes at it, but like the general idea is that, you know, the Christians became Zion uh, when the, you know, the covenant was fulfilled. So, I mean, uh, that's like, seems to me pretty powerfully anti-Zionist, to be honest, in terms of like contemporary Zionism, at least. I mean, you could make an argument it's like true Zionism, but it's very distinct from like, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem must be Jewish. Um, that that's completely. I think that's like it's completely like almost like a, a Judaic like Nietzschean movement that created that, and then they kind of relied on a American disposition towards Jews, where they kind of had like a positive view of them after viewing them as the enemy of their enemy, who were the Nazis. And I think that's like where it was synthesized from. Um, and then you know, I mean, and I think that if, if like religion has to do with, I kind of brought up India already, but like. How can you explain, you know, an Indo-Aryan religion like India India has? Like, how do you explain their Zionism? There's no uh, religious basis for it in them. Like, it just seems to me like a good counterexample of, like, the, of how it manifested in America. But, but like, you, you kind of just, like, I, th I feel like you, you and the kind of Apollonian people kind of, like, twisted into uh, this evangelical thing, which I think was, like, just, like, post hoc justification. I don't think that's, like, a sincere Christian uh, movement uh, can anyone hear me yeah, you're good. All right, it was just really quiet, so I didn't know what was uh, if. Yeah, I think I think he uh, his mic's broken or something. Ah, damn. Were you were you asking about why Indians support Israel? Is that what you were asking? 
Well, I mean, like if, if I, I, think that, to... I think that stems from the Pakistan thing. Yeah, I did. Right, but that's kind of what the point is. It's more about like it's more like your national interest can be. It's more like your national interest can find like a mutual. Can find like a mutual. I'm getting the. Uh, I'm getting the. Uh, it, it, I, I, I bring up India as like a place where like, your national interest can kind of shape uh, your, uh, your nation's name as opposed to inherently being, inherently being from a religious standpoint. Religious standpoint. When do you think, when uh, do you think uh, China's going to move on China's Taiwan? Move on Taiwan? I guess the uh, host has some technical difficulties. All right, do you guys hear my audio now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're Wait, good. Where, when did that break out? I'm. When did my audio cut out? Uh, like five minutes ago. It oh, cut out like, God. yeah, and then like after, so after Charlie started, uh, after Charlie finished what he was saying, or. Uh, I ah, didn't hear anything. Okay. And then um, a couple people okay, so spoke, surely, and then we could hear the feedback. Well, thank you for sticking with me. Um, so, okay, his question was about how Indians are pro-Zionist or something. Um, I don't fully buy this. I, I think Zionist support is really fundamentally based on religious outlook. Um, in terms of strategic necessity, I mean, the... Uh, the Arabs will sell oil. Um, there's no reason we don't necessarily need a military base stationed in the Middle East to get oil or something. And it causes so many problems that you could much more easily make an argument that Israel is much more of a liability than it is an asset. We're having to, you know, throw money at it. It might cause a major conflict with Iran, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think the support for Zionism is entirely understandable in terms of religiosity. Uh, even if you look at some recent polls, uh, again, it is very predictable due to uh, Christianity. There, there is just a correlation. Now, correlation isn't causation, but correlation between Christianity and support for Israel. It's remarkable. Uh, Gen Xers, 25% of my generation, according to one poll that I saw, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it, it does seem fairly accurate. 25% of them thought that the attacks on October 7th were justified. 75% um, of them thought it was unjustified. Once you start getting to the youth, um, they are total. First off, they're largely atheistic. They're also 50% non-white, and they are totally off the Israel train. And it's a 50-50 split of whether you think that that action was justified or not. So thing, first off, there's a major dynamic. Things are changing. People, you could say, might become more conservative or religious as they age. That's fair point, but whew, it's a pretty stark divide right there. And um, so, yeah, I think it's entirely based on um, religiosity. In terms of India, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand Indian public opinion. Um, you know, in, I don't know. India's, I, I don't, I wouldn't put much stock into that. Okay, I'll let in a number of people here. Okay, um, Jeff, you're up. Hey, good evening. good evening. Um yeah, I think you have an interesting formulation. I would place myself somewhere between access of evil and uh world war woke. Um personally, by, by you, know, that I, you mean you're a member of the axis of evil. You're No, I mean I I'm a realist and really I mean I think a lot of I think the elephant in the room is China, right? Yeah. Um and so when it comes to the fault lines of World War 3, you know, we have a war of attrition happening in Ukraine versus Russia. 
and then we have you know a powder keg potentially in the in the middle east and and the real but the real elephant in the room again is is comes to china and i i kind of i was talking to a friend about this last week and you know if you think of foreign policy as a triangle you have neocon on one corner you have like realist on another corner and you have chamber of commerce on the third corner i'm you know i I think china is this toggle between realist versus uh, chamber of commerce and i definitely am on you know more on the realist side there so you know anyway i think it's interesting to talk about you know shifts related to opinions with with israel and so forth i don't i don't really see america ever not being a friend to israel i mean it might become more nuanced um, than in the past. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I think it's interesting, but kind of not really the big, not really the real fault line of World War Three. It might be a trigger, but. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I the, the national security state is going to define the fault lines, you know, at the end of the day. And, you know. Chamber of Commerce type people, if you ask them, you know, what, what's your foreign policy, they might say something. Ah, we get we want to get along with everyone, you know, but they ultimately go along with the national security state. But I would say this. I wouldn't underestimate the importance of like on the one hand, cons- the, the Tucker Carlson conservatives to a remarkable degree, if not at quite a majority to a remarkable degree outright siding with Russia, and in fact, villainizing Ukraine. That was unexpected and remarkable. I I agree, and I think that's insane. I mean, I think that's as, as insane as people who sort of justified Hamas's attack on Israel, which was just absolutely gross. Like, yeah. these are morally black and white issues, in my, in my opinion. That doesn't mean there aren't, like, there isn't a broader context and there are larger grievances. That's not what I'm saying, but this specific like invasion of uh, Ukraine clearly wrong, specific Hamas attacks of Israel clearly wrong. Right. Um, but what about so, this? Yeah, and, what about this? And so I, I'm much more. I would just okay. hold on. I would just say I'm more sympathetic <clears throat> to Ukraine. I would say I'm net pro Israel, but really sympathetic to both sides for different reasons. But I'm pretty hardcore pro Ukraine, to be honest. Right. No, I I am hardcore pro Ukraine as well, uh, but. Just think about this. So the invasion of Gaza occurs, a ground invasion. And we start seeing images of dead children, apartment blocks destroyed, kicking down doors, all of it. Because they're going to have to do – if they're going to actually do this, they're going to have to engage in that type of like – Battle of Algiers style urban warfare. And if they don't do it, I I can't see them letting up the bombing. So we're going to see more pictures like we saw there. You know, the the hospital issue is, is controversial. But, you know, even putting that aside, I mean, does anyone doubt that apartment buildings have been destroyed? Does anyone doubt that a historically important Christian church has been destroyed. I mean, it's, this is serious stuff. And if the professional managerial class starts siding with the Palestinians, so it's not just being anti-war, it's, it's, you know, openly siding with the Palestinians. That really is troublesome. And yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it. it's going to be, all I'm saying like, you know, yeah, you've got to get the no, home I, front on board with this thing. I think that's a good, I mean, I think it's a fair point and a good one. I mean, when you consider the, the after effects, so Hezbollah, if they get involved and Iran gets involved and, you know, USS Eisenhower, you know, and Iran and, and Russia, maybe China, you know, it, it could, it could explode. I think the vulnerability on the public, public uh, opinion front is there. And you could see how foreign influence, adversarial foreign influence would, agitate to make that happen so that's something to watch out for as well just for an influence to turn opinion in the in the direction that you're you're stating which would cause i think some sort of confusion in our foreign policy alignment yeah. strategy yeah definitely um the other the other note i would just emphasize that the media is really filtered like i don't know 
how much we're getting out of Gaza. Like that's like actually quality reporting. I mean, we're getting some, but just, I mean, that's just something to keep in mind. Like a lot of stuff goes down that, that the American public just isn't even aware of. Well, no, you know, independent journalists are not there. I mean, th- this really is a, a war that is televised on social media, that which is also a very remarkable thing. <clears throat> All right. Um, I will go to six, Yukima nine. Oh, hey. Uh, hello, uh, hey. Vicky Spence. Mr. Spence, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I just, you know, I misread the title as Fault Lines World War III. Um, I, I do, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty open on my TL uh, of like my, I guess, pro militant stances for, for Israel to defend her security needs and, and all that. Uh, although I, I just do realize I don't have the same type of takes that I guess most normies, sensible people do in this situation in terms of what's a viable military target in terms of rules of engagement. I'm, I'm pretty cold hearted in this type of, um, in, in this type of take. And I've actually been pretty consistent when I said like, if, you know, if the Russians were, were to blow up a hospital, I assume they didn't just blow it up just to be assholes. Um, if the Ukrainians were hiding weapons or whatever, then it was a viable military target. Um, and that was that was my my also same take I have with Israelis. I don't think they're just bombing churches or hospitals just to just punish the Palestinians. Uh, maybe a little bit of punishment, but it's just to like, you know, if they're shooting ro- using that area as a makeshift bunker to launch rocket attacks, it's gonna you know that's the, that's the nature of war. That's that's what um, that's what U.S. military did in in those various squat wars and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, I would say that in terms of like this, the grander picture of Hezbollah getting involved. Um, yeah. This, this type with world war three talk, I, I'm kind of uncomfortable because I don't know if, if our, you know, the country is willing to go to war with Iran. There's going to be, you know, because, you know, that's kind of like the, the uh, major link between how, how this stuff in Israel is going to get um, get Americans involved with, like you know, the whole Iran situation. Um, I, I should also just make it a point, though. You know, there's a huge generation gap with Iran, and and with in terms of like boomers and like the younger generations, and you know, Generation X being kind of almost forgotten. Um, but you know, no one like boomers got to see, you know, the the revolution happen on television in 1979, you know, um, putting American uh, Americans as taking Americans as hostages, you know, declaring death to America and on all that stuff. And that's just completely absent in, in the conscious of many, you know, minds of, of Americans, uh, of younger Americans now. So they don't have that like anti Iran sentiment or just like equivocating that with like just really brutal, Islamic terrorism as a whole, and it's—I don't think it's fair to just completely blanket that with, with how Iranians behave and stuff like that. There's a there's a lot of, um, you know, funny ironies of within that region. Um, I would say this though: we have there's there's a lot of um, astroturfing about the progress made in Saudi Arabia, but that country has 30 million people um, that are losing that type of like oil, like you know very grand welfare that they're used to. And I see huge social economic problems. That's just not being addressed at all with Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and, you know, they've only taken out, they've only like reformed their textbooks by in 2021, when they decided to stop calling, you know, Christians and Jews pigs, not to be like associated with, um, there, there's an entire generation raised on Wahhabism and, you know, and most of them, I'm sure, has like were, were volunteering for ISIS. That's been completely undisclosed. Um, you have you see the fault lines just domestically within the you know quote unquote West in both Europe and America with this demographic of um, of youth of um, people willing to engage in violence. That's so. That's also going to be true. I think it's going to. Um, I, I already see this flaring up again 
with the not Ukraine or Russia didn't flare up the domestic strife you, that you're going to see now with this whole Palestinian Israeli thing. You you will see the level of violence you saw that you've experienced yourself with you know Antifa like that you know anarcho communist uh, you know ra- radical shit. It's gonna it's gonna escalate again. Um, I mean, it, it was always escalating. We, we saw what happened with Chaz and, um, you know, during the BLM riots and all this stuff. Um, but it's going to become even more intensified. And there's no going to be right wing pushback anymore. There's no there's no like equivalent of like a, a counter force because everyone's afraid of getting arrested at this point. But there, it's like this, like, this like, um, you know, some in Golem that's not going to stop. They've been so, you know. It, with all this uh, political violence, it's going to be just way more left wing violence that that can't that can't be countered, and it's just going to be really interesting to, or maybe it will be, but I uh, I don't know. Um. Yeah, I, I'm kind of I'm a little bit skeptical of Antifa hugely taking the the Palestine, I'm the Palestinian side. I I don't know Antifa actually hasn't been terribly anti-Zionist, to be honest. The BLM? No, 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 uh, they are. They are. There's already, like, Jewish kids. BLM getting, is different. BLM's but different. Jewish kids yeah. are already getting, like, assaulted in Berkeley right now over yeah. um, the uh, over this uh, stuff and over these uh, demonstra- counter-demonstrators and all this stuff. And I just see it becoming more and more. It's, again, just flaring up again, but it's going to be much more intense Um among left-wing type of radicals. Right. Uh, we'll see. We we will see. But I, yeah, I think you're, yeah, I think what you're saying is probably right in terms of the, the BLM coming out full-throated on October 8th, basically, in support of Palestine. That, that was remarkable. It's one thing to come out once the bombings began, it's or the ground invasion again. It's another another thing to come out when you had, you know, roving gangs of paragliders attacking families. Um, obvious sock puppet, my favorite. Welcome back. What is your question? Yeah, good day, Richard. Uh, good day. Just want good day, guys. How you doing? Uh, um, uh, had to get it the other way. Uh, yeah, the um, there was a question about five or ten minutes ago about Indians and what they get out of Zionism. Um, <clears throat> supporting Zionism, I should say. Uh, I don't think it's a religious thing with them as it is with the evangelicals in America. It's more of a transactional thing for them. In Amer- America, they're uh, heads of major corporations now on the West Coast. In I think the CEO of Google and uh, a whole bunch of other tech companies, they're, they're Indians, they're expatriates. Um, and of course, there's the Pakistani issue they have uh, on the right. northwest, uh, and of course they have China to the northeast. So uh, they're they're probably searching around for allies uh, right now, trying to. Uh, 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 it, it's a natural thing for them uh, to align themselves with interests against their enemies, which right. makes perfect right. sense. Yeah. So uh, that that was my little take on the Indians. And uh, a little personal anecdote: I used to work with a, a Sikh. Um, he was a he was from uh, northern India, and uh, he went back to India on one of his little trips back home. And he came back. He was very very anti uh, 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 Muslim. Very very. He, he started visibly uh, talking uh, like verbally talking about it and uh, trying to talk up this uh, far-right political party we have in Australia, which is called One Nation, which is kind of pro-Zionist as well. And, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting turn that this was over 10 years ago now that that he had. So, uh, yeah, that's just the way I see uh, how the Indians are are pursuing their uh, alliances at the moment. Um, But, uh, yeah, this Israel thing, it's the one blind sight. Like, if... I was to wanted to divert attention away from Ukraine. That's where you'd hit just to get the attention away from Ukraine, put it on Israel, 
And obviously, uh, uh, the support for Ukraine is going to be much lesser now that Israel is barking orders uh, across the uh, Atlantic trying to get more aid. So it's it's a pretty interesting thing that... <sighs> There's just no happened. question about it. I mean, I, I don't... I don't know how like deep into the rabbit hole of this I want to go. I mean, it's mm, yeah, fair enough. You know, because there there does seem to be there's a reasonable we could reasonably believe that Bibi Netanyahu should have known that his country was about to be attacked by these roving bands of you know Hamas militants. Now, did he know and let it happen? That that's that's another step, you know, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's difficult to take. Um, there is no question that this takes energy away from Ukraine and actually jeopardizes Ukraine's future. And Ukraine came out really early sympathizing with Israel. And, you know, we, we totally understand you've been attacked. But it, it muddles everything in multiple ways. First off, it just gets all of the the attention going going to the Middle East again. It kind of returns us to the 2000s away from this neo-Cold War that was brewing. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's all of that. It's going, to, it's going to take some of the money or a lot of it that it's being, that could have been allocated to Ukraine. Um, I, I think there's some, uh, there's some kind of deeper elements to this. As, as I remarked with Joe Biden's speech um, the other, I guess it was last Friday or last Thursday, he was like, we, we can't, leave Israel high and dry. We can't forget, or we can't turn our back on Israel, and then we can't leave Ukraine high and dry. It's an interesting way of phrasing it. The, the fact is, if you're objectively looking at the situation, you are more likely to see Israel as more closely similar to Russia than... And, you know, there's there's a lot to that. These are both the entrenched major powers that are engaging in a sort of revisionism. So Russia is obviously trying to reestablish the Russian world or the Warsaw Pact or the Soviet Union, etc. Not necessarily the ideology or the economics of it all, but definitely the geopolitics of it all. And Israel... You, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. You, you can't give me some kind of like economic incentive or something like that to explain settlements. I mean, that is fully about. I mean, they're they're fighting over Jerusalem, the um, you know the uh, the city of David and uh, the city of Jesus, the two messiahs. I mean, this is what it's about. It's a religiously motivated desire to uh, basically have a full Israel, a Judea, once again, that is controlled from Jerusalem. And that is the motivation. And I, you know, a lot of people were kind of pushing back when I said this, but like, how far away from the minds of policymakers or voters? Are these issues of, you know, the third temple or, um, you know, a, a renewing the uh, dual monarchy of David and all of this kind of stuff. This is very present in their minds. There is a it's a background motivation, but it's a it's a religious motivation, much in the way that Putin himself declares that, you know, the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the destruction of the Soviet Union. So he's he's trying to bring it back geopolitically. Israel is trying to bring it back biblically. And they're both attacking countries that are weak, even though a tremendous multi-billions have been thrown at Ukraine and the Palestinians. Billions upon billions have been thrown at them. But they are weak countries. Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons that were stationed there it, as it became independent during the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, it's getting pushed around, etc., by Russia, and similar to the Palestinian case, uh, they yeah they probably did miss a lot of opportunities to create a state. They have acted 
in bad ways. That's all fair. But they, you know, they didn't have the European backing for their state in the way that the Zionist Jews did. It wasn't a movement in Europe with all that that entails, as it was for the Zionist Jews. So they were kind of late to the game. And their desire for nationhood, un, like, at the end of the day, conflicts with a vision of greater Zionism. And so they're really caught in this terrible place, much like Ukraine, geographically speaking and geopolitically, uh, is a obstacle for Putin's reestablishing of the Soviet sphere. And so Ukraine and the Palestinians actually have a lot in common. And, you know, again, the, but, you know, Biden created those fault lines. He was basically, you know, we can't leave Ukraine high and dry. We can't turn our back on Israel, et cetera. I mean, it is what it is. Ultimately, the national security state is going to define this. But I think this is going to be a very interesting World War III precisely because we have these kind of weird countervailing forces in the United States to a much greater degree than we had during the Cold War. Um, I'll go to Polly first, and then I'll go to Andy and then Gay Patriot. Uh, Polly, you're up. Um, hi. I'm uh, wondering, you see all this spreading, you know, you talk about it becoming World War Three, and you see it becoming such an issue here in the United States. You know, you keep seeing all these videos of of people getting into these huge arguments. Don't touch the cactus. Sorry, I have a cat messing with something. Um, anyways, you have, like, you just see it kind of spreading in the United States. And you see people getting very animated, be it politically um, or you know, just personally. And for me, uh, that's concerning. Um, I'm, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things that are easy to believe as far as, you know, what set all of this off. Uh, you could easily say that, you know, Russia wanted a distraction in the Middle East, but I mean, ultimately, it is a matter of you have a bunch of bad guys that are working together to basically destroy what they see as Western type democracies. Um, and I just, <laughs> you see, I just, I have a lot of concerns about this spreading in the United States because just over the weekend, you saw like, um, I posted a video earlier of this Jewish guy just getting his ass kicked by a bunch of pro-Palestinians. And I don't know. Um, I'm wondering, have, have any of you heard about uh, the fact that apparently a bunch of civilians, Palestinian civilians, uh, followed the Hamas members like through the gates and everything and have also taken hostages themselves um, like some of the hostages are at, were at one point um, in the custody basically of families who essentially go on to sell them either to Hamas or to uh, whatever the Islamic Jihad um, well, I don't <laughs> doubt that something like that could be taking a place. Uh, I have not looked into that myself. But, I mean, what, would you have a question or, or a point? Well, because you? you're kind of rambling there. I mean, I, who am I to criticize someone for rambling? But it is my show. <laughs> I'm wondering how, how quickly do you think this is going to ignite um, problems in the U.S. and kind of because of the problems it's causing in the U.S. either force our government to either be like, no, we're not going to get involved because we have issues here or are going to want to jump in more. I think that the national security state will define friend and enemy and 
they will manage serious issues in the United States. That we ultimately don't live in a democracy where there's like an up-down vote on who our enemies are. That That is defined by the national security apparatus. And they have, in a way, already defined who the enemies are. But I do recognize that like the ability for the U.S. to fight an extended war like this depends upon a unified home front. And I do think there's like a very real issue of not just like Palestinian militants in the U S or, or, or people protesting or something like that. I think there's a real issue of like professional managerial class or hipster types really turning on Israel. And also of Magatards, um, turning on Ukraine. I mean, it, I think they're kind of two things that are that are real possible. I call them Trump tars. Speaking of Ukraine, um, something I've been thinking about a lot, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this. How much of this right wing, like anti Ukraine attitude, do you think is uh, maybe not solely, but strongly based in the entire first impeachment and that whole thing with Zelensky? I think that definitely helped it along its way. Um, I think there are a number of different things. I, I absolutely do think that there are, um, there's pro Russia, Russian propaganda going on in the United States. Oh, yeah. um, I, I do think that there is like a concerted effort on behalf of Russia to promote dissident voices that are, and it's mostly just dissident voices but voices that will, at the very least, stir the pot and get people distracted and, and so on, get people fighting with one another, but in, in some cases are outright pro-Russia. I mean, I do think that that's real. Um, I, I also think that the siding with Russia does express a certain kind of alienation from the professional managerial class, at the very least, by MAGA people. So yeah. I, I think there are a lot of different causes going on where they're kind of like, you know, fuck it. I hate the media so much. I hate the corporate managers, the bureaucrats so much that are, I'm going to just side with Putin because he's based and Christian or something. That's yeah. a real thing. Yeah, I think the Christian uh, so thing is huge. Yeah. Um, now, the idea of imagining Russia as this, you know, Christian society is also a bit absurd, but yeah, uh, God they're doing me. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let me just go to some other people, um, but you can stay up, Polly. Okay, gay patriot, you are up. Gay partisan, excuse me. House okay. Pfizer. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Ignore the uh, bio. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, you're bipartisan, but gay. On yeah. very member. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, okay. I was just... Uh, wait, go on, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Please. Um, so, like, you were talking about, like, you know, how there's, like... Um, I think the... Uh, okay, um, there's a lot of issues were, you know, discussed in the past few minutes. I can't really focus on which one. So, as for the uh, Hindu nationalism, I think it's mostly um, motivated or fueled by, um, you know, just general anti-Muslim um, sentiments, you know, like there is this nationalistic aspect to it, you know, but uh, I think it's just the disdain for Muslims overall that motivate. And as for um, the prospect of a World War Three, I mean, like, personally, I'm pro-Israel. I'm pro-Ukraine. I'm your traditional, you know, uh, left of center liberal kind of and um, I don't know. To make matters worse, I suppose um, I'm actually uh, who, who, who was the guy who brought up Saudi Arabia? Hey, uh, gay partisan, ask a question or kind of make a point. All right. Okay, my my bad. Um, so, do you think that um, Saudis, for example, will be siding with Israel? I mean, like I see, there's a lot of conflict between you know, like you know. Yeah, back and forth between Israel and Saudi, but you know, but they again they have the common enemy of Iran. 
So, um, yeah, this, that's pretty much my question. What do you that's think? a fascinating Maybe question now. because they, they have religious motivations to not side with Israel. They have economic motivations like the uh, Abraham Accords, which they weren't fully a member of, but to side with Israel. Um, they have geopolitical motivations to side with Israel due to their relationship with the United States, although that is often adversarial. No, I mean, it's, it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. I, I don't have a strong answer to that, but that's actually a very good question. Um, Andy P, you're up. Hey Richard, how's it going? Um, I was I was wondering if you'd be okay if I provided a little bit of historical context on Christian Zionism and maybe push back a little bit on maybe some of the misconceptions that uh, people have with uh, with Christian eschatology. Okay. Go for it. Um, so I, I think I think that there's a, a common misconception in today's uh, society when when particularly when secular people look at evangelical America. And they see a very pro-Israel uh, Christian Zionist church, and that particular eschatology um, wasn't part of of Christian doctrine until the 1800s, with with uh, until a man named John Darby came up with it, and it was popularized by a gentleman uh, named Schofield, the Schofield Reference right. Bible, which was actually his research was actually funded by Samuel Untermeyer and several other Zionists. Uh, not even Christians, which it became the predominant eschatology, interestingly enough, of, of Truman. But to make a long story short, that's not the predominant view, or that, that it might be the predominant eschatology in America. It's not the predominant eschatology around the world. And there's a growing number of Christians in America who are returning to post-millennialism and amillennialism, which doesn't take a stand on the nation of Israel. If you read the Westminster Confession, I think it's chapter 19, paragraph three, um, Israel as a nation is kind of irrelevant to the modern church. But I'll, I'll concede that the predominant view of evangelical America is a Christian Zionist uh, a viewpoint. But yeah. I think it's important to note that um, those distinctions. So you're talking about the Westminster Confession of Faith from 1646? Uh, correct. A lot. Of, there, there's been some updates to it, uh, I believe, in, in the 1800s. But it's it's the confession of you know the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church in America. A lot of Reformed Baptists use it, okay. etc. Um, well, obviously, Israel was in a completely different uh, state at that point. I mean, the the Zionist the, the Zionist movement had not begun. Would you describe that as post millennialist in the sense that the millennial, the millennium already happened in a way, and we're now, you know, I mean, how would you describe yourself? I mean, what, what, what help me understand pre and post millennialism, et cetera. I, I want to go into this, so help me understand it. Okay, so let me let me give you let me give you just a real fast. I don't want to, you know, I'll try to be brief. So the predominant. The pre predominant view of evangelical America today um, holds to a, a view of the future that requires there to be a physical state of Israel, the rebuilding of the third right. temple, and that those are necessary prerequisites to um, what they believe will be a seven-year great tribulation, followed by the return of Christ in the millennial kingdom here on earth, followed by judgment. I don't hold to that view. Neither do most Presbyterians or Reformed Baptists. Uh, the other, the other two um, eschatological positions are amillennialism and postmillennialism. I happen to be a postmillennialist, but both amillennial. To, to answer your question, both amillennialists and postmillennialists would likely adhere to the Westminster Confession and Catechisms. Okay, so uh, postmillennialism basically means that. Jesus has already come, and we are trying to kind of bring the world. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, so so post post millennialism is so the belief of post millennialism is that Christ is reigning at the right hand of the Father in heaven now, and at some point in the future, uh, there will be either a symbolic or a literal thousand year period in which 
the church will have great influence upon upon the world. So I would argue that hasn't even begun to happen okay. yet. So that could be in five years or five million years. We have no Interesting. idea. Interesting. Okay. And then amillennialism, and, and, how would and you describe to, that? Amillennialism is Christ is reigning. So the, the millennium, the, all this millennium talk, it refers to Revelation That's chapter right. 20. Um, and uh, amillennials believe essentially that there's a symbolic millennium occurring in heaven at the moment. And at some point in the future, whether a year from now or a million years from now, Christ will return. And th this is all important because um, this these these eschatology the particularly the dispensational premillennialism it didn't it didn't begin to take off in popularity until um until the zionist movement and the eschatological positions between judaism and dispensational christianity are actually quite similar in the the requirement to rebuild a third temple um and it's really interesting that this was you know you know by the end of world war ii there was you know, over 2 million Schofield reference Bibles in American households right. and Truman was a dispensational. And then of course, in 1948, Israel became, became a nation. So it's, it's interesting the connections um, between that theology and the, the creation of the, the state that of Israel. That is fascinating and very important. Um, let me do this. So I hear that via the Twitter account, techno barbarianism, uh, we actually have Donald Trump with us. Um, so, I mean, he, this is a direct feed from Mar-a-Lago, mm -hmm. or maybe even Fulton County Prison. We don't we don't quite know, but um, techno barbarian. That is to say, Donald Trump. Please join us. Let's go. Hello, Richard. It's great to talk to you. I am uh, calling directly from Cell Block D. Oh wow! I am. How are uh, things? I, I am. I'm, I'm doing good. I've been watching a lot of the news regarding this whole Israel thing. It's a great tragedy. So many people have lost their lives. It's honestly just sickening. So I, I've come up with, a, I think, a solution that I think everybody will be happy with. And frankly, here's what we're going to do. We're going to nuke Israel. We're going to nuke Palestine. We're going to flatten it all out. And then on the spot where it used to be, what we're going to do is we're going to... They're good people on both sides, is what you're saying. But we're gonna well, they're gonna we're be, gonna they're nuke gonna be, both. Yeah, I mean, I get it. We're gonna there's gonna be dead people on both <laughs> sides. But then what we're gonna do to make up for it is we're gonna build a giant Bass Pro Shop covering the entire country of Israel Palestine. Is gonna be a Bass Pro Shop, and inside the Bass Pro Shop is going to be a rainforest cafe. Oh wow. Oh, so you're bringing everyone together. I mean, you're bringing in the Republican base. But then also all of the technical bureaucratic managers, they'll just eat at the Rainforest Cafe. And you'll, you'll yeah. have created the third temple itself. I mean, you'll have fulfilled everyone's demands. You, you, it's a greater Israel. It is the third temple, the kingdom of David, plus really low price bait and tackle. And excellent. You get good, hammer, you get good yeah. camping equipment. Yeah. And, and yeah, you get the, the wonderful volcano Sunday <laughs> with brownies and the sparklers in it. It's great. And you see the animatronic gorillas. It's, it, everybody can get behind that, I think. Well, I, I'm behind it. Uh, you know, count me in uh, for this, definitely. So, what, what is going on with Sidney Powell? What, how could she betray you in this way? You know, frankly, I, I don't. I don't trust women. I think it's just the nature of things. It's how it goes, right? You know, the, what's her face with the, the Queen of Bathsheba, right? She she betrayed that guy, whatever the hell it was. It's it's a real tragedy, but we're gonna we're gonna press on through this. I I, I have a feeling things are gonna turn out okay. Okay, that you you think you're gonna get off. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this: I'm going to get off one way or the other. I think it's going to. I think it's going to happen. I think we won't be seeing any any jail time. Yeah, no. I mean, well, if you win the presidency, will you pardon yourself? I will pardon myself, but I will probably still stay in prison because that's where all my stuff is. They have the cool see-through TVs. They have cool see-through uh, handheld yeah. gaming consoles. That, that's true. I mean. That would really be quite a presidency. I mean, we had not we have not seen anything like that, of you hanging out in orange jumpsuits, checking out the iPad, 
lifting some weights from prison while building a the largest bass pro shop ever created in the Holy Land, a new sort of Holy Land. I mean, I do you think America's ready for this? I think I think we will be ready. I think when the time comes, we will be ready to to rebuild a third temple in the form of a Bass Pro Shop. It will be a giant glass pyramid so large you can see it from space. The the reflection off the glass will probably melt satellites. It's going to be good. Uh, that that is uh, that's really great. I mean, I guess my only question really remaining is, you know, what about a PF Chang's as well? We could probably do a P.F. Chang's. I would also maybe like a Cheesecake Factory exactly, somewhere in yeah. the mix. I love Cheesecake Factory. You know, get them, get the moms on board. Moms love Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So what do you think is uh, – what happened to Ron DeSantis? So many people were so excited about his campaign. You're now beating him by 60 points in some polls that I've seen. What, what, what are your comments on this matter? You know, I think I think when when we it was at the debate and we saw him do that smile that he was doing, it, it just became apparent to everybody that this guy is a big fat pussy. And yeah. I think after that point, nobody liked him anymore. Yeah. And what about Christina Pushaw? Are you going to bring her on to the campaign for um, cele- you know special services, so to speak? My thought was I might bring Ice Spice on, the, the rapper Ice Spice. I think that, you know, I need a shorty like that who looks like she has Down syndrome. Uh-huh. I think that would be a good addition to my harem, my roster of, of bitches and hoes. <laughs> this sounds excellent. I, for one, just can't wait to vote for you. I mean, I want to see this. I, I, I am all in for what you are promising. Well, I appreciate your support, Richard, as always. All right. All right. Um, Hail Trump. uh, Hail Bass Pro Shop. um, Hail P.F. Changs. Uh, Thank you for joining us, Donald Trump, once and future president of the United States. Thank you. All right. That was something. Um, Hey. I wasn't wasn't ready to walk in on that. I wasn't ready to walk in on that. I've... uh... Sort of felt like I entered the twilight zone a second there. Well, Richard. I mean, turning Thank all you of the Holy Land into a Bass Pro Shop, I mean, it's it's a bold strategy. It just might work. I mean, we're ready. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah. What else What else is there? Definitely. Um, all right. You know, I'm, I'm going to skip around here. So Dipset uh, Evro Gang. I imagine you're going to have a hot opinion on this matter, so I'm going to go to you. You're on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm a Palestinian in Crimean, um, both 50%, 50% Palestinian, 50% oh, wow. Crimean. Oh, caught right in the center of, of World War Three. yeah. Yeah, I'm caught right in the middle of the Crimean War, and so I wanted to just say a few things. I think that you – I think that people have been saying that Benjamin Netanyahu – set this whole thing up with Putin Uh and I think that I think that is true I think that's a true assessment and I think that um, there's a long term Soviet overlap with uh, Israel and Russia Mm. and I think one of those are we can see at the protests how they'll provoke the protesters with the Jewish uh, basically tied to the Mossad through the JDL is listed on the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center website as extremist organization jdl jewish defense league and they go to the palestinian protests and they are tied to meyer kahane and avador eskin avador eskin is tied to the kremlin through alexander dugan Hmm. and so i just wanted to say also lev laviv he is a jew he's tied to the jewish russian mafia and he is um profiting off blood diamond mining in Africa, apartheid, and then he buys the settlements in Palestine with the profits off those blood diamond mines. So he's doing double apartheid. And so he's also tied to the Russian mafia. So I think this is a long-term espionage strategy of the Soviet Union and Israel working together. Benjamin Benjamin Netanyahu, Likud party, Simchat, Torah treason. And I think that uh, 
that we have to understand um, the Mossad, how they work by of deception, and that they will also kill their own hostages through the Hannibal Doctrine. And so that um, we should just not um, boogeyman Hamas because Hamas is a freedom fighter, just like anybody else fighting for their people that ha- don't have a, a real official military. And so they don't have an official military in Palestine. So what, what do you expect them to do? Do nothing while uh, elderly and children get killed. And then so even Charlie Kirk will change his stance later. And he won't apologize to us. He won't apologize to anybody that been talking about how Israel is a terrorist state until they bomb a church. And then he'll say, oh, I think this is actually wrong. Mm-hmm. And then so they bomb a hospital that's a Anglican Baptist hospital and they bomb a crusader church and they act like we shouldn't crusade total Aryan victory in Ukraine, total Aryan victory in Palestine. And that's all I wanted to say. All right. I, I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. Um, oh, Charles, do you want to jump in on the, uh, the connections between, you know, the Soviet union and Israel because, and, and the kind of back and forth in the cold war. You talking to me? No, Charles Johnson. There's like 20 Charles's in this conversation. Uh, it's insane. There's another Charles. Well, well the, the other King Charles uh, yeah. once said, the other King Charles once said that uh, the problem with this issue are all the American Jews. Hmm. So think of that which you will. He was maybe onto something. Um, yeah, I mean, what can I say about this? I mean, look, there's a long connection of, you know, KGB and Vladimir Putin that goes way back in time. Yeah. They have a very close relationship. And, you know, it's not a coincidence that he called him right after he got elected this last time. I mean, there's a relationship there. And maybe they figured out that they could serve each other's interests. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to imagine. Well, let me put it this way. It's hard to imagine that Netanyahu wants to go to jail. Right. And there's been like a series of protests going on in Israel. And he probably figured, like, what the fuck? Let's have this war. Let's have this, like, conflict. Maybe everybody will rally around me. It's happened in the past. And so that's probably what he was thinking, you know? But I think I think the Israelis will tolerate criminality. I just don't think they'll tolerate incompetence. Right. So I think he's, he's in trouble, basically, would be my gist on it. And I think also that the IDF is not really capable of actually doing a ground war in Gaza which is the dirty little secret. So they're kind of basically just going to bomb from afar and they're going to like maybe have some snipers here and there, but basically they're not really capable of doing all the door kicking and cleaning out of Gaza as people might imagine. So they're going to have to do bombing from the air and that's going to lead to a lot of civilian casualties. This is a pretty densely populated area. I don't know if anyone else has been to Gaza here. I mean, I've been there. It's, it's a pretty miserable place and everybody's kind of stacked on top of each other. Sure. You know, so it's, um, yeah, I mean, the, the long and short of it, though, is that there's always been this relationship. And people are very fr- afraid of DNA testing in Israel because they're afraid that many of people will discover that a lot of the people who are so-called Jews there are actually Russians. It's a big, it's a big problem. Yes, that, that was a, a major issue. Um, all right, let me go, just to spice things up, let me go to total Jewish victory. Praying for Peace 33. You're here to sweat in this sauna with me. Well, I didn't know that's why I was here, but thanks for informing me. Okay, total Jewish victory. You're on. You have to unmute yourself. Go. You have to unmute yourself or I'm going to kick you off. All right, there he goes. All right, Charles, the other Charles, Charles Charlemagne. Oh. Charlemagne. Shabbat. Let's go. Yes. Um, so I mostly wanted to speak back. This is uh, I wanted to speak about the earlier discussion on sort of Zionism, support for it from India and both from Christians. And I'm sort of seeing. I'm not. I'm not really interested in the India thing. Can you just talk. Yeah. To no. Me no. About, no. I like, just. Yeah. So Armageddon. Um, that's inter- like the political opinions of Indians. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, let's talk about 
with cool stuff. So I think. Wow, are we even are we even allowed to have this casual racism, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm here for it, but I just want to be sure that, like, we made sure we got our inoculations. You know, there are a billion of them, and they can be kind of annoying if they get in your mentions. That's true. They will just annoy us. Yeah. As it, That's their death. geopolitical strategy is pure nuisance. Right. But I don't – these Indians, like, popping off, taking Israel's side and being, like, insanely anti-Muslim, I, I just find this just, like, ridiculous. I mean, I don't, I don't want to really talk about it. Um, okay, so I want to talk more about, like, if you want to talk about the Christian perspective, that, that interests me. Well, I'm not a Christian, so I can't really speak specifically from that. I'm just understanding well, You identify more... as Shamanya, and you're not Christian? You identify with the, uh, the pagan slayer, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor? Look, he was just a cool guy named Charles, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's what I identified with. I think of myself as a, as a pretty cool guy. Um, uh. I think... Uh, sort of the whole conflict. Uh, actually, can you? Uh, is there anything? I had. Is there any other points you want me to talk about? Because I'm not really sure. Like I'm starting to, my brain is starting to lose what I was initially going to say. All right, you're being removed from speakers. You just were not ready. Um, oh, here we'll have a. Um... I am going to bring Andrea up because we'll get a, a, a hot and spicy um, perspective from someone who is pro-Israel. So, Andrea, go for it. I just want to say, Rachel, what you said about the Indians is spot on about them supporting Israel and hating the Muslims. They come into my <laughs> all the time. Spot on. And I just think it's disgusting, the hate of the Muslims. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I get a casual racism pass from Andrea. That's good to know. I just, you Thank know, you. like a bunch of them, on, a, bunch of them on, a bunch of them, on, a bunch the of them, a bunch of them, a bunch of them unfollowed me because I wouldn't stand for their Islamophobia. So, yeah, okay. they followed me because I'm pro-Israel, and then they unfollowed me because I'm not an Islamophobe. Anyway, well, you didn't you say your father is a Muslim or something like that? No, my kids are Pakistani, so that really triggered them. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Oh, yeah. Well, that, yeah. I can see that. Um, but anyways, what I wanted to do is I heard Elon Musk and um, was this Vivek talking today about World War Three, and they said basically that America needs to um, not fight so hard on Israel and give up Ukraine because basically if World War Three starts, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran will all fight on the same side against America, and America will cease to exist as we know it. And basically my thoughts on this is that um, – I think that America needs to continue to do the right thing and not be scared of like all these powers working against them and not really be scared of World War Three. And I think that Elon Musk and Vivek making everybody more stressed out than they already are with fears of World War Three is probably not too healthy for the Twitter population. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, we have to fight for what's right. And Israel can't, you know, just... I mean, America can't just stop backing up Israel because Israel is doing a fight that's not only going to protect Israel, but also is going to protect the rest of the world from these awful terrorists. So I think we just need to move forward and not have a ceasefire. That's that's my opinion. Well, I agree with you, Andrea. I, I think that I listen to a lot of that space and I, I listen to a lot of it live and then I listen to some of it uh, in recording and to be honest, I, I just there is there are too many platitudes per minute. They, they like surpassed the allowable platitude limit in my mind. And Elon just thinks he's being profound when he's saying something that like I would hear from my eighth grade history teacher or something. And he thinks he's like discovered this through deep reading i i, I just find something well, about him, like, insulting he's like a, a, a lot a, of a, a nuclear war is a, a, you know a, 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 a civilization would actually end it would not be a war for territory civilization and it's like yeah <laughs> like I knew that a lot of us a lot school, of us buddy. after like a lot of us after smart. the Go ahead. After the two weeks, a lot of us need therapy from all the stress. So adding the thought of like World War Three on top of that with all the stress and all the nightmares and all the anxiety we're having in front of 40,000 people in a Twitter space, I just think was very unhelpful and I think is putting a lot 
of fears on people that they probably don't need to have. I think a lot of people are very traumatized right now. People are really scared right now. A lot of people yes. are going through a lot emotionally. And I just think it just, I think Elon Musk has a great responsibility as the head of Twitter with all his followers. And I think he sometimes does not handle that responsibility very well. Well, that's obviously the case. Although I, it brought out my inner Nietzschean where I, I feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like we're too comfortable on the planet and we might all need to be tested by this upcoming world war. And so I, I think we should embrace it. War is good. And you know what someone said on my, on my Twitter, they said that if world war three happens, China, Russia, and Iran and North Korea will just spend the next thousand years, you know, like radioactive or whatever they'll all because they'll get nuked too. So they'll, they'll lose as well. Everybody will lose. Yeah. Everyone. Like, I don't lose. think anybody but will also, win. are we really, that positive about China as a world power that's going to defeat us? Are we that positive about Iran? I mean, I, I don't underestimate them, but I don't think we should overestimate them. And I, I don't know. I, I just, it's just this assumption that you brought up that we should just like give up because of all of these massive countries uniting. I don't, I don't really buy that. And um, I don't agree with that. I think Elon Musk saying that is ridiculous because you have to do what's right. You can't let the bullies bully you. Right. And I think the right will win in the end. And I think that, you know, caving into terrorists like Hamas is just not the way to go. I just like the idea of like a renewed agonism on the planet. I like the risk and I it's inter it is pretty sexy when you think about it. Totally. You know, I mean, I sure as shit think it's more interesting than the Olive Garden, you know? Well, hold on. When you compare World War III to the Olive Garden, then, well, that that's like a tall order, so to speak. I mean, um, you know, Trump is... But think about how boring... I mean, the Olive Garden is. is heaven on earth. I mean, it, it the, there is the Book of Revelations, and then there is the Olive Garden as a full immunization of the Ashalaton. You know, and Richard, did you hey man, it's one endless part? pasta right now. It's endless, endless pasta going on. Like it is, if Ooh. there is a heaven, it would be that. It would be endless bread, Richard, breadsticks. Did, did you catch that one part of the space where the one guy tried to blame the Biden administration, <laughs> and they said that like Elon doesn't want to talk about. This. They kind of tried to change the subject, but they tried to say this is all Biden's fault that World War Three is going to happen, and then they said, well, <laughs> that's not Elon Harvey or whatever. They tried to like change the subject and not like criticize biden well yeah because you are facing a grand jury yeah three grand juries hey, does anyone want to <sighs> sorry I, I just wanted to have to interject about something that was said earlier the olive garden but I, I wanted to i want to add in the fact and although i disagree with this guy a lot the the half palestinian guy who spoke earlier yeah. uh, i'm going to just say right now that across the political spectrum there are israelis who could kind of give credence to say uh, to to the guys that you know Netanyahu may have um, may have gotten word or may have had you know foreseeable knowledge of this attack by Hamas. That doesn't remove agency of and th these are Israelis of like across the polit political spectrum, like both very conservative, um, more centrist, liberal, even like just you know left wing and all this stuff. And they're just like they just said like. You know, Netanyahu, like, how could this security, you know, the greatest, you know, secure border in the world, like, just allow this stuff to happen? And um, that's just kind of the auto response. But, of course, they are, they have to just rally around as a state of, you know, uh, of Israelis. Uh, they they want to, you know, they want to, um, you know, take out Hamas as much as possible. Nobody's um, rallying behind Netanyahu. Everybody's against Netanyahu. Netanyahu's out of there. He's and never he getting did, elected he also again. He declared he was going to resign anyway, but it, it's it's just kind of crazy. Like I've I've observed across the political spectrum um, of Israelis who believe that Netanyahu basically let this attack happen. But again, this this shouldn't remove agency, and and it's kind of just weird to say that. Oh, you know, Hamas wouldn't do this. It's like they have videos. They posted videos up of like them killing babies massacring entire families you know um burning corpses and stuff like that and uh, and cutting off people's heads i don't off. think anybody thinks that netanyahu let this happen 
I just think they think that he failed to protect them, and that's why they don't want him in office anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's also... Well, I mean, he funded Hamas, right? Right? I mean, he funded Hamas for years as a strategy. No, but I, didn't, I think you guys need to understand that Hamas would still be what they are today, regardless of the funding that's not that's true. a hot minute that's that Israel funded all. Hamas. Mm-hmm. Not true. Well, right that's, now, I think that's really guys, not true. guys have been reading Haaretz too much. Well, I, I would believe Palestinians... No, I mean, I just read fun. Netanyahu's statements where he talks about funding Hamas as a way of weakening the Palestinian Authority, uh, you know, and, and making it so the PLO can't win elections. But at that this was point, very, the Palestinians are getting more aid in at, 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 at this point, the Palestinians have gotten... Hamas, including Hamas, have, have gotten more aid internationally than anything that, you know... You know, uh, the Likud government has given them um, in terms of just fu- what the fuck are you talking about? Internationally, like, you understand Palestine? how the aid get, like, gets to them? Well, it for does Pal- get to them eventually, it, Charles. It I mean, does get. To yeah. You know how it gets to them? It gets to them through Israel, allowing certain groups to give them the money. Hmm. Like, yeah. I mean, well, well, Helen, no, 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 the director of Mossad literally went to Qatar and said, hey, can you keep funding Hamas? And now there's this pressure campaign against Qatar for funding Hamas. And they're like, oh, they all live in the Four Seasons or whatever. First of all, not true. They like occasionally will stay at the Four Seasons because that's what you do when you go to Qatar. There's like four hotels in the whole place that are like livable if you're a wealthy or dignitary or whatever or have security threats. Uh, So... I mean, it's just like there's like a lot of misinformation flying around here. And the other country that was funding Hamas or like allowed Hamas to have operations was Turkey. And you know, people forget this, but basically a week before the uh, the October 7 attacks, there was an attack by the PKK on the on the National Assembly in Ankara, right as they were opening up the uh, basically the National Assembly for the year. And who trains the PKK? That would be the Israelis. So very interesting details there. Um, and it seems to me that what's happening is that Turkey is replacing Israel as a stalwart ally of the United States. And what Biden is doing is he's bear hugging the Israelis and he's sending over, you know, not one, but two carriers to watch them to make sure they don't do any war criming. The last time, by the way, we had a ship in the region when they were war criming. That was in 67 and they sank the USS Liberty. So, you know, what's happening is that Biden is basically hugging the Israelis so tightly that there's not a lot of maneuverability that they have to, to, to basically commit all these war crimes. And he's delaying the conflict. He's basically prolonging the potential ground war because he knows that the Israelis can't actually win that war because they don't have the soldiers to do it. Their armies are not professional enough to do it. Nothing Charles is saying is accurate. I just want to say that for the hey, record. Kick her, kick her. This woman's a propagandist. She's an IDF spy. I exposed yeah. her a couple of days ago, but yeah, well, not she's an just IDF kicker. spy. Like, she's just she's a liar. Kick her, kick her, kick her. I think no, this, if you look at her bio, uh, you can find out everything you need. Charles, she uh, adopts a new space. religion every year, apparently. Yeah, but kick her, Richard. Come on, no, be serious. No. This is this is my space. Why, you, why do you have why do you have why do you have IDF spice? Well, I like to keep, keep IDF Richard spies keeps it spicy. Seriously, yeah. I'm not an IDF spy, Richard. I don't want to for Israel. Here, keep your I'm really not close. an IDF spy. Such a liar. I think no, be crazy. You guys Pizza for IDF. I Uncle, can you handle this? <laughs> For the record, I, I do I, I do work for the IDF, but they don't pay me anything. I just um, they only pay me in milk because our milk. And he gets paid in uh, your pussy. <laughs> Do you know that Pizza IDF doesn't even pay me? I just help promote them because I think they're a great organization. Well, I mean, yeah, you do. I really so do. I've not changed my opinions because I have very firm principles. But regardless, if the IDF wants to pay me, I mean, again, I don't have I don't have takes for for cash, but I do accept cash. That's I don't know if that is, you know, I I only take Kazar milk. <laughs> Cash app and bio. Richard, just put your cash app in the bio. <laughs> All right, let's. Abby Shapiro can unblock me. Let's go to Hunkle. You haven't spoken. Oh, yeah. I was. Uh, I. Okay, I love the idea of war. Don't get me wrong, but I'm kind of skeptical that World War Three is going to happen soon. Mm. 
that's sad. I, I, I mean, we, I hear this, I've been hearing this a lot. Like, whenever Soleimani got killed, people were, oh, this is going to be World War Three, sure. And it's like, I, I, I don't know. I've just heard it, like, this is going to be World War Three. This is going to be World War Three, And, like, I don't know if I'm just desensitized to it. Lazy marketing. It, it seems very sensational and... I don't quite buy it. It's, supposed to be I on can... Mars by now anyway. Isn't like Elon supposed to be like having the Mars colony running? Like what the fuck? Yeah. Man? Give us some time. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm excited. Well, I mean, do if, you if think, we were what is go... your argument for how this is all going to start to de-escalate? I don't know. Nothing's, nothing's happening. Like a ground war is, isn't like it's being delayed. Yeah. Like there's, it's like all it seems to be grinding to a halt. Do you I, think that's going to continue, or this is just the calm before the storm? Um, I think it's going to continue until the foreseeable future. I'm not a psychic or anything. But well, I'm not asking you to be. A I don't psychic. see anything. I'm just asking oh, you to, yeah. you know, analyze phenomena. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't see anything happening. Um, anytime soon to be honest okay i i think there's some other indications out there that something is about to happen that we actually are going to see a ground invasion i think it's the calm before the storm richard i yeah. think they're just keeping things quiet for a little while and then boom something big is gonna happen oh, okay see i how agree with big... the idf spy yeah Okay, so how I, how yeah. big is Gaza? I just want to. I'm just kind of curious in terms yeah, of Gaza's like I don't the think... size of Washington D.C. times New York City, five or right? something. New York City. Yeah, it's five miles. It's like the, wide. It's like it's New York largest. City. Yeah. Okay, so it's okay. Um, so IDF IDF infantry are gonna be are gonna be heading in there. I know this for a fact, but I, I just don't think this is going to be like. But the thing is, it's it's not Hezbollah. But although that things will pop off. Hezbollah will pull something once once the ground campaign starts going on with Gaza, um, but but I don't know how much of that is going to translate. It's it's a big coin. Flip. That's going to be the coin flip when um, if you know stuff with Iran is going to get involved. We have a lot of problems just with within Western militaries, just in terms of munitions and public will. Um, for us to just tolerate another war, uh, especially over Iran, yeah. um, because they decided to hit things off with he- Hezbollah, like or you know things happen in Hezbollah and Lebanon. I, I just don't. Um, that's also the well. Don't you think Although, this is okay? So the bombings are con- are continuing. There's a reasonable chance that some sort of ground invasion is going to take place. I've I've heard the number three three hundred thousand troops thrown out there so that that's more than putin amassed at the um, ukraine border um don't you think that some of these other players might want to sit it out just for a little bit in the sense that this ground invasion is going to be like the battle of algiers i mean it is it's not going to even be like ukraine which is almost like trend like world war one style warfare with modern weapons. I mean, it, it's terrible. It's going to be worse. I mean, you're going to have to go house to house, room to room, even. There are tunnels everywhere. There's booby no traps. Too. Yeah, the look, optics, Richard, and I'm not you saying think? this is some Israeli hater. I mean, there is a reasonable suggestion that this will be so disastrous that it will be perceived as a loss. Just the PR, Richard, alone. Like, images yeah. that will be distributed amongst the media of Israeli forces getting IED'd or ambushed uh, by Hamas. Like this, this... Yeah, the actual the actual top brass, the people who actually fight wars, don't want this to happen, which is why it's being delayed. Oh, it's, it's not just that. I mean, Hamas have been no, known to use child soldiers and stuff. And oh, yeah. It's still so, not going to look good. Hamas, good. Will and way to... Hamas will go to every length yeah. possible to attrit as many uh, Israelis as possible. And like they won't care exactly, yeah. so it's going to be. They'll make sure to get it on gruesome. camera. There will be no rules, period. Yeah, there's not going to be. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if the kid was holding an AK or throwing a grenade at an IDF guy. It's it, and then the IDF guy shoots him. That's all the like the image is probably you know. Right. That's what's going to be propagated. Um, I I know, I know that's what's going to 
ba- basically going to boil down to. And but it's like, what are I mean? Dude, the IDF could have every ability to just level Gaza no, entirely, they're not, but they're, they have to. They're going to basically try to use planes to do it because their air force is down with the ethnic cleansing because the air force is the most closely tied to BB of any of the branches. But if they're going to. Well, you know, they're gonna they're gonna be evacuation orders into into certain blocks, and then, and then it's gonna be you know free fire zone after if they don't fucking leave. Um, I that's basically I think what's uh, you know that's gonna be kind of how things are gonna go down. Yeah, but, uh, the international community will not allow a Gaza invasion; just won't be allowed. I mean, that's the international. Yeah, the international community. Basically, if that happens, then you can consider all the Netanyahu assets in the U.S. terminated. Because that's what's going to happen. There's going to be retribution over all that. But did you hear the guy from the State Department say today? He said that he doesn't support there being a ceasefire. He said Israel's got to do what they've got to do. Well, you, I so mean, you have to say that. What are you going to do? Tell your ally, oh, shame on you. You need to reevaluate your uh, perspective here. No, you can't do that. Everything will crumble. And uh, the pro Palestinians will come out of the woodwork and say, even the US government doesn't support you. So you, you can't, Israel, you can't Israel, Israel said three to America before. Israel's I've seen in the past where Israel sat there and said to America, We'll do what we want to do when it comes to defending ourselves. So if push comes to stop and Israel wants to do a ground invasion, I think Israel do a ground invasion no matter what America says. Personally I would love for Israel to do a ground invasion because then all of their assets in the US and Europe are like fair game. So for me it would be great because it would give us an opportunity to like hunt down all their spies. So I'm for it, personally, because I think it would make the United States a safer place. We'd have fewer BB people running around. That's but... not going to happen. Oh, it's already happening. Did you just not see what just happened to Robert Menendez and Kevin McCarthy? Oh, Charles. So the reason why the, reason why the ground invasion is happening, ironically enough, is to minimize civilian ca- casualties. Because you know, otherwise, it's just carpet bomb Gaza and that's it. But they're not going to do that. They're going to have to – they're going to send in infantry, uh, do something about the tunnels as well. But it's it's going to be a lot of ugly urban warfare. Um, but again, you know, those those IDF infantry lives are putting themselves at risk to, to very small arms fire just to enter that and just enter the kill zone of Gaza instead of just, you know, again, just relying just on it. The, the last know, ground war war. that Israel fought was with Hezbollah in 2007 and they lost pretty clearly. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. And the IDF themselves admitted that their army wasn't capable of having a sustained ground war anymore. According to Israel, they won. No, according to the IDF and the action report afterwards. I mean, where do these people come from? Like, you, do you not read, like, your actual press in Israel? Like, have you actually, like, do you actually know Israelis or are you just one of these people? Just, which, like, one she, of only, these she only knows her handler. <laughs> okay. Which, I mean, it's really ridiculous. Like, which war, by the way? Because 82, there was a lot of heavy tanks. In 2007, in 2007 okay. there was a war with Hezbollah. Yes? Do we remember this? Yes. yes. There's some of us old in this space? Yes? Okay, cool. And there was an after-action report after that war, which found that Israel lost the propaganda campaign, and they lost the ground initiative, and that they did not have a military capable of sustained military occupations anymore. That was the conclusion of the IDF. It was submitted. Uh, one of the people who actually served in the committee for it was Yair Lapid, who later became prime minister. So, like, and by the way, Ehud Barak also agreed with the report's conclusions for those who are, like, staying at home and paying attention. So, uh, you well, know, it's, I've, it's, heard, I've heard Israeli okay. soldiers come into my TikTok live and talk about that war with Lebanon, and they said that, and they fought in that war, and they said they won the war. So I don't know. You said they I don't know. Say whatever they want hey. to say. I've heard them talk about it. They can say whatever they want I'll, to say. But I'll, I'll give this military. to you. I'll give this to you, Charles. So, from it's kind of funny because uh, um, I've known some IDF guys, and some of them are telling me just the military's gotten soft because they've adopted more of the you know woke military policies of um you know of, of america of other western countries and stuff like that in terms of i mean it's always been kind of lax you know everyone has to serve blah 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 you know it's it's with the general population but um there has been a lot of problems he i've been told um within you know the within the israeli military um just for various reasons i guess but um yeah they are they themselves are worried about you know, incompetency, incompetency problems and, and, and fitness problems. And but such. The problem is, like, um, two weeks before this conflict, 
the military came out and said that they didn't have enough soldiers because the issue was was that the basically the ultra orthodox don't want to serve they want to basically just get welfare benefits and because Netanyahu moved his soldiers to go protect them during the you know the Jewish holidays up to the West Bank that's what left Gaza defenseless this is not like a secret um, everybody kind of knows this in Israel it's like talked about all the time in the press and on TV there. You know, like, I think we should actually have, like, real Israelis in these spaces rather than people who purport to speak on their behalf. I think that that would actually help. Um, because, honestly, a lot of... You would shout them down as Jews. Jews and you already <laughs> shouted her down. You already shouted no, no, her, not, Andrea. Not, like, not well, you're... That have an angle I'm, just, like, I'm just not... I'm not into people who are fake, who are fakers and frauds and who accuse me of being a liar when I just post my receipts in the Jumbotron. I mean, get you fucked. Mean, well, you were a federal time, informant. We know that. Charles, sure. you like I was a proud federal very... informant, and I hunted spies for a living, and I was very good at it. But Charles, you always you claim these see... Mossad connections. So like really at least he was an informant for our government and not a Nazi. You're goddamn right, right. And I was good at it. And many, of the, people, and many of the people who are in jail or who were killed by the FBI, I'm very happy to have sent them to their maker. Charles, you like there. to speak for Israelis and Jews. You're not Israeli or Jewish. My mother lived in Israel. She actually converted to, to Judaism, by the way, to marry an Israeli guy who died in a car accident. My mother went to Tel Aviv University. She, served, she lived on a kibbutz. My grandfather helped the CIA with the Israelis on the Sinai. So I'm more Israeli than you are. Get I don't off. think Andrea's um, naturally born Jewish either, right? Is, have you converted? No, I think technically I'm a Jew. Oh, if you oh here, we, here we go. If you here we go. If you like, I think it's like vampire. Suicide then. Here we go. Uh, uh, right. Right. I did not know this, he Charles. Did, yeah. That's insane. All right. All right. Um, all right. Cyber ideology, why don't you jump in? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, I wanted to uh, say that Charles is completely correct. Uh, Israel, after the Hezbollah war, admitted that they lost. Um, that's like that's not a dispute of fact. Um, I, I'd like to point people to Brian Berletic, um, his analysis on what's going to happen. Uh, he's a military analyst, um, and I'll post a link to his latest uh, Telegram thing. And yeah, I'll post it in the for you know, but he, yeah, he he um, he says it's down to artillery, and that um, Israel ran out of artillery, and that's why they stopped the um, that's why they stopped the last war and. They don't have um, the they don't have the equipment for the planes and they don't have the equipment the shells for yeah. the artillery. And so there's because of Ukraine Russia there was a uh, Russia uh, Ukraine was drawing down the stockpile of uh, artillery that the US placed in Israel because the the very last time that a big shipment of weapons came to Israel was like um, was it after 67 or maybe a bit later but certainly before 2000 and like Israel had no massive stockpiles and then the U.S. Uh, gave like something like three hundred thousand artillery shells as a stockpile, and Ukraine was drawing that down. But now Israel has said, "Hey, stop that because now we need them." So the actual when you look at the fault lines for World War Three, you have to realize that both Ukraine and Israel are going to be drawing down on, uh, yeah, like the U.S. the U.S.'s arsenal. So I think it's and so he looks at it's all kind of technical stuff, but it's sort of. Um, he looks at the rate at which shells are being used and how, how quickly they're being manufactured. And he thinks it's down to uh, industrial production. And so the reason why the US one would like to have the war now rather than later is because China is continually growing and there's just a small window of opportunity before China becomes just far too large. And that's why in the, the last, um, uh, if, you, if you saw the money that Biden requested, it was for... Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, which are the three, obviously, um, kind of... So you're saying that the deep yeah. state wants a war with China now? Yeah, now, it, it, now because China's growing s at such a rate, 5% again this year, that um, if they don't do anything now, that China will just be too big to take on. So you have to do it sooner rather than later. What that's about the, the, that's the demographic theory issues with China? Um, I don't know, like... I really can't speak to that, but I mean, that's... I'll I'll be brutally frank here. I don't want to live in a Chinese-dominated war, so world. So if we're going to have a war with China, let's do it. Yeah, I mean that's, but I mean I think that is the thinking, right? Yeah, They're I'm totally, totally aligned to with the U.S. government on this one. No, Pardon? the Chinese won't fight a war. They're totally adverse to taking casualties. 
because of the one child policy. Anytime you kill one of them, you basically wipe out a family line. Mm. Anyway, I, I like I I'm not a man. Now would no always family. brag like, that you know it's like you could you could kill a million people with a nuclear weapon and we. No, like, he offered he care. offered to give Kissinger 15 million women. And Kissinger wrote down in his diary that so this was quite an unusual proposal, but that he had to <laughs> transmit it back back to the White House. So you know that that might have been the start of Asian fever. I think <laughs> might have been um, low fever. And oh, sorry. Could I also say that uh, the electronic intifada? I don't know. I mean, you don't have to like what they like their position on things, but their military guy he said that. Um, that Israel will be screwed in a ground invasion because of just, they have like 500 kilometers of tunnels and that it's their home turf and they've been preparing for this for like ever. And um, so, yeah, the real reason why they, have the numbers. they haven't they gone have in the yet numbers. is because they're afraid to. But um, but the thing, oh yeah, I remembered what I wanted to say. Um, so the thing is, they have is it Bibi or I'm not sure who, but they've already promised that they wanted to wipe out Hamas. So they're calling this the maximalist position. Mm -hmm. So once you've committed to that, they've it's like they've already created a bind for themselves because in order to wipe out Hamas, you have to do a ground invasion. So even if they didn't want to now at this stage by the military brass, they've already committed themselves to it. So they're in a bit of a pickle. So it's, it's I mean, we're I've in my... Uh, 50 year lifespan i've never um i can't remember a you know more interesting period in history to be honest anyway i'll mute myself and let others speak the well, ground invasion is happening it's they're being mobilized there's guys being called up i know it's happening No, they're being mobilized but they're not necessarily going to invade that's the difference just because you get a mobilization order doesn't mean you actually engage in a ground war this has happened many times in the history of israel Okay, well, this is hyper-circumstantial considering the amount of people who died in the, the uh, Simcot attacks. And it's just the reaction, the, the, the sentiments. It's just... Remember, the question is, how are they going to respond? Are they going to respond in an intelligence war? Will they target the people who are actually responsible? Will they level Gaza and basically cleanse the place like Netanyahu's political coalition wants because they want to basically take over Gaza, right? It's a part of their Lebensraum strategy. So it's it's a very simple question, like like how are they actually going to respond, and which part they don't of... want to take over Gaza. They said that they don't want to occupy Gaza. Well, it's you know, going to be an occupation of war. You have Netanyahu's well, own political allies. You have Netanyahu's own political allies saying it presents a rare opportunity to take over Gaza. So... Yeah, I, I, aren't we just past? Like we crossed the Rubicon on this matter. Like with there, the people talking about two state solution or something. I'm just like, seriously, go back to the '90s. I mean, th this is just not a realistic proposal, but, but Richard, and it becomes, kind of hype, it, it becomes a kind of hype. It becomes a kind of pipe dream. Richard, here's the and thing. secondly, Paul, there's, there's a half Tom, a million. Hold on, hold on. There's a half a million to three quarters of a million settlers in the West Bank. Yeah, I mean, we're we're just so beyond yeah, all I mean, of this that, talk. That is, I, that, that's Richard, why Tom, supported Tom the Tom's quoting like every random person in the Knesset, like every voice is like I such a powerful voice. I literally just put up on the jumbo oh, Tom, Tom, an Tom, Israeli Tom, think tank. Tom, Tom, no, no, I mean, listen, you're you're you don't even come with receipts. Like you have no opinions that are worthy of paying attention to. I just okay, put you know up what, on the jumbo chart. You should leave again. You should leave again. You're you're useless. Okay, I just put up in the jumbo. Trial. I'm not going to sit down, Richard. I'm not listening to it at like twelve o'clock at night. Listen, you, Richard. You yeah, just to... just repeat. And uh, Andrea, just content you make your point. My point is that you know, listen. There's a lot of people in the Israeli government that say a lot of things. A lot of times, it amounts to not a hell of a lot of anything. Listen, the consensus in the Israeli government is that they're not going to occupy Gaza. They're going to. Defeat Hamas, I guess they think they're going to. I don't think that's quite possible because I don't think you can defeat an ideology. They think they're going to defeat Hamas. And then I don't think they really have a plan for what's going to happen afterwards. I guess they think they're going to somehow control the next, you know, overlord that comes over taking care of Gaza for the Palestinians. But they don't know exactly how they're going to do that. So they're trying to take it, I guess, one step at a time is what we understand, okay? So well, that's, okay, that's fine. Now, I, that's Richard, I just totally want to fair. comment on the two-state solution. 
As for the two-state solution, okay, listen, I understand in order to have a two-state solution and give them a reasonable amount of the West Bank, you'd have to you'd have to move a good amount of settlers out. But here's the thing, right? Okay. If they really wanted to move, you know, a few of those settlements out to give them a reasonable amount of the West Bank, they could do that. If there's a will, there's a way. So you know what? If someday they really want to do that. They can do that, but the question is: Will they ever want to? Do, will they ever get a left enough to center and a, a left leaning enough government out to do that? And here's the other question: Will the Palestinians ever agree to a two-state solution? Because they've offered them two-state solutions so many times with 97 percent of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, all these things, and they've never taken it. Back in 1947, they got offered 45. Let me finish. Okay, Let's finish. Okay. All right. Zagonal, you respond to the uh, Hold on, claim let me just that do one more offered. thing. Back in nineteen forty seven they were offered forty five percent of the land and they turned it down. So the bottom line is that they don't want a two state solution. They want Palestine to the river to the sea. They want lie. all the land. That's the well, bottom okay, line. Okay, but so does Israel. I mean, okay, Zagonal. You no, can Israel respond. doesn't yeah, want all the land. They just the want the land. Uh, Count Bernadotte was a uh, Dr. Lai. by um, Lehi extremists uh, and Irgun extremists as well, and Lord Moyne as well, when they were trying to draft a plan and basically offer concessions about Jerusalem, making it truly an international city, no business of East and West. Um, they were going to try to reconnect the Strip with the West Bank, but uh, a lot of um, very uh, rabid people were saying that's ancestral pastoral land, we can't give that up. And they were basically saying, no, you're going to have to deal with this. You can look up the plan. It's a uh, pretty moderate and very fair. And he was killed. Both these men were killed. And later, the, the groups that assassinated them were placed in high-ranking positions in the military and the government and what later became the Likud party. And I'm sure Charles knows a lot more about this, but that's basically how it started in 47, 48. They assassinated the people that were trying to come yep. to a fair conclusion. That's how it yep. started. And in, fact, and in fact, Harry <laughs> Truman's, in fact, Harry Truman's own daughter writes in her memoirs that her father endorsed the creation of the state of Israel because they too were worried about him being assassinated. And then you have other examples, like when George Herbert Walker Bush was trying to tie aid to Israel to tearing down the settlements, there was also a plot by supposedly rogue Israeli intelli you know, intelligence officers to assassinate George Herbert Walker Bush, which is, again, something that he wrote Rich, about. Because I'm, I'm not listening to conspiracy theories. Richard, the I mean, this bitch is so wrong on so many topics. Please, comments. please. Like, they could have the partition plan. Just they could have leave. The partition plan. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know the history. You don't even read Hebrew. Okay? Like, you don't know anything. Goodbye. God damn, Richard. Like, you gotta have, you gotta not have the fat ones in, okay? Like, the fat, dumb ones. I mean, it's embarrassing, man. Hey, that's true. It doesn't really help the Israeli side. I gotta, like, I gotta be, like, the one-man army here, and she's just kind of, like, of being a no, you can you can you can. I like I am pro Israel. I've been to Israel. Like I, I have an ex girlfriend of mine who's leading the protest against Netanyahu. You know, like she was my date. You know, in Milton your Academy. mother is uh, Jewish. My mother I've was a Jew, a like literally. Although she she's Episcopalian now. Oh, uh, basically, okay, yeah. I, think, I think that's the final state of all Jews is to be Episcopalian. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, you got to. But but anyway, that's um, ridiculous. I mean, I do think that's the final. You're just state claim of making. No, I'm not. You, you can look it up. Jane Lundquist, look it up. Lived in Israel. No, no, I believe that this is the case. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, by the way, it's I, I don't I, – I had talked to a Chabad rabbi one time, and he was like, oh, your mother was in Israel. Like, therefore, you're a Jew. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, five bucks and gets me a Subway sandwich with ham in it. Like, I'm not a Jew. Like, I don't – there's, like, no way you can get out of it, you know, which is the worst part of it, by the way. Um, but anyway, like, look. The problem is there's a lot of people who just don't know the history on these things. And I put up in the Jumbotron for people who are actually curious about this stuff, the Haaretz story that came out. I mean, it is a fact that Netanyahu funded Hamas. And he did that to undercut the two-state solution. So you're quite right, Richard. Like, they don't want a two-state solution. No. They want to wipe each other out. And frankly, they're sucking all the rest of us into it. And it's right. annoying as fuck. Like, I wish one side would just win. 
you know? And honestly, at a certain uh, point, it's like, can, let's just can do I a speak to the, Can I speak to the um, Israel or Netanyahu funded mass thing? Could I? Sure. Just a second. Go. Um, I, my, my take on that is that maybe at one point it was advantageous for them to create a wedge um, and uh, against the, it was it the PLO at the time? I think before the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, it was, but I Fatah, think was Fatah. Fatah was the political uh, yeah, party. But, it was, but I think yeah, that's that in the past now and like whatever. Secular. Granted, but I think that was in the past and like, so Hamas are their own thing now. And I think. No, no, um, in 2019, Netanyahu Public said that his strategy. I mean, this is not a this is not a conspiracy theory. Like, I could find the things and put it up in the sure, agenda. But that was, he was talking about past events, though. It's no, like no, no. It's he was talking about his it? current policy. His current policy was to embolden Hamas as a way of weakening a two state solution. He said it in the Knesset. It's on tape. Okay, People, I'm okay. I'm trying so. to differentiate between the initial creation of them, the funding of them, and what policy was. So, given what they, it was true maybe in the past that. Uh, they funded them. It, it was. It can't be true that say they were funding them in 2019. That's ludicrous. I think because no, they nobody were. They were 100 percent funding them in 2019. Yossi Cohen went to uh, went went to uh, uh, Qatar and asked them to continue funding Hamas. Ah yes. Okay. But so again. So let's differentiate between like Israel themselves funding them, say, or a third party funding them. Th that's so. That's diff when you say that they. The, All right, this is the quote, the okay? So you can listen to the, I mean, this is that's, a public statement. Anyone yeah. who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas. And that is what mm -hmm. Nenya told Likud Party Knesset members in March 2019. This is a part of our strategy. And okay. you, there are many examples we could point to here. I mean, I can put this up in the Jumbotron for people who want to do their own homework on these sources, but like, this is not a controversial subject. This is like well, this is like basic bitch stuff that people are talking about in Israel, like right now. In terms of like a very yeah. like Machiavellian uh, policy towards this, yes, it's true that basically they've tolerated, especially Likud, Likudniks, and you know guys who just never want a real two state solution and wants a kind of a de facto three state solution with Europe and Jordan. Um, but the thing is, you know, the the Palestinians also have a will of their own. They have their own agency and they constantly take the bait in terms of, you know, l allowing Hamas to be in power and to, you know, just do these things just to put that caveat in there. It's not just because it's like, you know, these Palestinians you just have no agency like they do. They so you know, they very willingly give um, give themselves to Hamas and their cause um, in terms of giving it all Israel right? per capita detains people without charges more than any other country on the planet. When there have been nonviolent Palestinians who've tried to participate in civil disobedience, they've been arrested and held without charge for years, decades in some cases. So no, there's a, there's a problem here. And the problem is we have Israelis assassinating journalists, which we saw with Shireen Abu, Abu Akhle earlier this year, who was shot with a sniper bullet in the head while she was interviewing somebody. And like, this is not a responsible country. Like, we need to be honest about what's going on in Israel. And increasingly, people are seeing it, which is why their opinions are changing on it. Much the same Wait, she, was, she was assassinated in, a, in like, in what context? Because if you're a journalist in a war zone embedded with Dude, troops, seriously, that's just given risk. Like, like, shot on the street. They denied that it happened. And then they, they walked They lied about it repeatedly. Then they blamed Hamas, and supposedly, for, shot, for shooting her. And then when all the forensics came back, and they did it. They said that she. They said that effectively she deserved it. Okay, like that. Is, those are the facts. By the way, she's an American citizen. They shot her, a woman, unarmed in the head with a sniper rifle. They did not punish the person who did it. They didn't even put him on leave. Okay, like yeah. that's what we're talking about when we talk about Israel. Wow, that's and not very surprising. I mean, the, the talk of the town right now is the whole Justin Amash situation. Didn't he lose like three family members, Christian Palestinians over in Gaza? It's brutal out there. I mean, it was an armor piece piercing shell to the head of an unarmed woman wearing a pants jacket. It speaks for itself. And if you read Rise and Kill First or you watch the movie The Green Prince, you will know that there's been a concerted policy 
of the Israelis to assassinate anyone who speaks up against them, not just in Israel, but around the world. Okay, and what they do in the United States is they build blacklists of people, which we're seeing right now of all the students who are being harassed because they signed some letter or they put something up on social media or whatever. And what they do is they try to blacklist you and get you fired and ruin your life. That's how it works. The Canary Mission, which Adam Milstein put together, which, by the way, he offered me a job working at the Canary Mission back when he thought I was super pro-Israel. Um, Adam Milstein basically wants to build a database of faces and names and addresses of everybody who's anti-Israel who's anti -Israel in the United States. He went to jail, by the way, for tax fraud, really for being an Israeli spy. So, like, this is what we're up against here. Like, people should people should know, like, the real history of this stuff. And in the apartheid, you know, in the protest against apartheid in South Africa, we were able to, like, muster together and get people to actually try to change some of the policies there. And ultimately, it led to the collapse of the government. I think the same thing could happen here in Israel. Ace, would you like to jump in? Yes, I just also want to throw in my support for Olive Garden on its side note. But uh, also, I was curious, since you've kind of been in both camps, what you think the distinction between the anti-war left and right is. Because I, I guess some people would assume uh, the Buchananites were supposed to be like the anti-war side of the Republican Party, but that didn't seem to get a lot of influence. So I was just curious if you saw a meaningful distinction between the two. Well, I mean, I, I guess I could go back you know, two hours when I was talking about this. I mean, I, I ultimately don't think anyone is ultimately anti-war. I, I think they just have very particular principles. And, you know, a lot of the MAGA people and conservatives were kind of pretending to be anti-war. And they, it's ultimately that they supported Russia. And, uh, and and that's going to continue. I don't think they're going to be anti-war when Israel is, you know, in the game in the sense that they are they are Christian Zionist and pre-millennialist or however we, Schofieldites, however we'd like to describe them. Um, but I, I just I don't know. I, I think an anti-war position is it's ultimately a mask. But, you know, I don't know. Someone who's genuinely anti-war, I just find figuratively gay to be frank i mean who's actually anti-war it's just a kind of i don't know a unhuman way of dealing with things i mean we we obviously have enemies and we want to defeat him let's uh let's go to mike i want to hear the uh rothbardian libertarian perspective on this hey mike what's mello up? hey yeah, thank you, Richard, for the mic. So I, yeah, I just want to pop in here because we're having some very fun, interesting conversations, especially whenever Charles is involved. And so, I mean, real quick, from I guess the, I guess a Roth a Rothbardian perspective, it just it, I would defer to private property lines and trying to line up the maps as best as I could. I very much don't like ethno nationalism. I really don't give a shit about Israel or palestine uh i just i'm america first i want to make sure that the problems that we're facing here are solved with our money and yeah i i don't want people to die in the middle east so that's that private property um, is a creation yeah. of the state have you ever thought about that i've considered private before property only exists as a kind of legal fiction so i think libertarianism is like inherently wrong but the state of nature, Richard, the state of nature. The state of nature, like homesteading, or you mix your labor with material and you generate private property. This is all silliness. It's a like, legal you... fiction. Like real estate, the word real estate, the etymology of that is actually royal estate. It's, it, it's it inherently a creation of government. And so this whole, it's like libertarianism is just based on like a fundamental misunderstanding. Do you think it's a psyop? Like, where do you think it comes from? No, I think it's wrong on so many dimensions that you sort of have to. I think wonder. it comes from a, a type. I, I think there are who promote chief moral. 
You're roboting, Richard. Oh, am I still roboting? Marty? I have, a, I have a quick question. So do you believe it's more, I, I believe like American thoughts on property is, is more, much more influenced by John Locke than say, like, I guess how Europeans were more influenced by Rousseau. I, would, would that be more of a fair take? Cause I think, well, I think Rousseau has influenced just the worldwide left wing in general, but it, that's how, but John Locke is more of like kind of that libertarian branch of thought that, that had us. America. With that being said, I did post a thread up in the uh, in the nest. I, I want to approach the uh, Israel uh, Palestine situation from a bit of a different angle. I want to get the panel's take on it. So, just before the Hamas attack on the seventh broke out, there was uh, there was a deal um, being worked out between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia with the help of the U.S. And, of course, you know, the attack uh, really scuttled this uh, deal. I just want to get your guys' perspective on it. Do you think this would have been like, – what do you think? Like, what was the purpose of the deal? Do you think that this would have increased the likelihood of a two-state uh, solution? Or I'll leave it at that. I don't see it up there. I don't see – I see the Ryan Grimm thing. Uh, I, I have an idea about that, if I can – you could chime in. Yeah, so I think like the people saying that Hamas um, did this attack at this time in order to scupper the rapprochement between um, Saudi Arabia and Israel because once uh, Saudi Arabia recognized Israel then any chance of Palestinian statehood was gone. I think um, I think this th that's going to be one of the consequences of what happened on October 7th but um, and Possibly Hamas were thinking like that, but um, I, I think it's, uh, I find it hard to believe. But it, it's also interesting when you think that um, in the last round of the BRICS expansion, both the Iran and um, uh, Saudi Arabia were going to be in, you know, BRICS plus. So clearly um, somebody didn't want... Saudi Arabia falling into the Chinese orbit. So it like it's an interesting I think I think if you want to look at the um Saudi Arabia recognizing Israel angle, you have to look at it in in the perspective of the BRICS angle rather than the Palestinian angle. That's kind of my take on it. Interesting. By the way, quickly, Charles, um, would you have any comment that the Shireen uh, death, or uh, aka her assassination, happened during exchange of gunfire between Palestinian government in the West Bank and IDF. And it's it, you, you claim it was a sniper bullet, but it was you know, from what I understand, it was just like another AR, like you know, five five six round. No, it wasn't from a sniper. Oh, well, that's wrong. Okay. All right. Well, go do some homework on it. I recommend the intercept stories. What was the What was the caliber of bullet? Used. It was an armor-piercing shell. So okay. you just got any other talking points? Go do some homework. Come back. Okay, Xbox. Let's go. Oh, um, yeah, I guess broad question. Uh, I don't know if this has been discussed yet, but I'm curious if either you or Charles have thoughts on the Samson option. Um, this is an uh, <laughs> idea in Israeli uh, nuclear doctrine that if Israel, because of their lack of geographic depth, were to lose a conventional conflict with its neighbors, it would resort to the use of nuclear weapons. That much seems plausible, but there is a, a permutation of the Samson Doctrine that's been suggested by some commentators. I think there's an Israeli historian, um, something about Van Creveld. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's like Dutch Israeli, and he has suggested that there might be a kind of vindictive retaliation against European capitals with Israeli nuclear weapons. <laughs> Um, and I, I guess that some Israeli military officers have said things that vaguely hint at that. Um, but this also, you know, I'm happy to bash Israel all day, but this seems a little far-fetched. Um, but it's become a, a big talking point uh, among critics of Israel. So I'm curious what you guys think about it. Well, yeah, I mean, look, there, there's something inherently apocalyptic about the state of Israel to begin with. And I, I guess I'm using apocalypse here in the, um, not in the true sense of the term, 
of uncovering, but as a as a kind of in times or you know final solution, I I hesitate to use that term as well. Like I don't think you can get away from this line of thinking when you're talking about this country. We're not talking about Finland, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is it's the blood and soil nationalism of Israel is you know it's a larp on to 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 one degree and it, and it's also kind of secondary on another i mean it is about reconstituting something that never existed it's about reconstituting the kingdom of david etc et and you just can't, i i just i find it when people try to get away from this and they from the religious quality of it and they start to talk about like strategy or you know, like the people there and blah, blah, blah. I just, I feel like they're missing the point. So it's like, do you want to, I mean, as Putin said, like, you know, should we have a world if Russia can't be a part of it? I mean, should there be a world if Israel can't be a part of it? I, I can definitely easily imagine Israeli strategists thinking like that. So I, I think something like the Samson option, I mean, it's totally outrageous, but Yeah. So, so you think it's it's quite plausible that implicitly Israel is subjecting Western allies to nuclear blackmail for strategic support? Well, I, I'm not. It's not necessarily like an ongoing blackmail campaign. What what I think is that there are people who think in this direction, who are policymakers in Israel. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, the, I don't know the enough question, about that. Of course, is could they deliver it? unlikely right like how would they do it submarines right like there's like a lot of questions here that go on on these yeah. things and then there's the question of would israel see it as strategically advantageous to pretend that they would do that even if they wouldn't do that right which is another aspect of the kind of game theory thought process that goes on right right so if, you know so there's there's a lot of elements here that like i don't think you can necessarily trust any comment that any of these people make at face value I think you have to sort of think about the history and all that. And that, of course, is if you believe that nuclear weapons are as dangerous or and as damaging as people say they are. And I myself have am somewhat of a skeptic of that. I think much more dangerous are biological weapons, which the Israelis are also building. Hmm. I have a follow-up question for me. Sure, obviously. Um, in 1973, when uh, Israel was getting there, well... They weren't doing so well on, uh, on the ground invasion front. Um, they threatened to nuke uh, countries then. Uh, I'm guessing they were Arab countries. Does anyone have any information? Uh, I've vaguely read through um, Nixon's uh, autobiography. And uh, it was, was it a threat by Israel to light up the Middle East? It with was a threat and... as a way of getting... So the question... There's a lot of questions about this period. So the, mm. the 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 question the main question is how credible was that threat was that threat cover for Nixon to help them in the 1973 war you know what what's the real story there basically is the long and short of it and to be honest with you I've studied the period I don't really know the answer because remember you know Nixon wasn't exactly famous for telling the truth right so mm. how much of that recounting of that period is embellished like were they did they actually have the planes ready to go with the nukes in them that they were ready to blow up these cities you know how real is any of that or is it all just an elaborate fiction to give nixon cover to support militarily the uh you know the israelis that's sort of the question well listening to nixon's tapes about on the domestic front he didn't he didn't have any well he had kissinger but he was very reluctant to have any other uh uh uh, of that particular type of people in his leadership team, uh, he, he was he was cognizant of the fact. Uh, there's there's no way you can uh, say that Nixon wasn't cognizant. Oh, no, I mean, of I mean, yeah. you know, Kissinger himself, like, you know, was himself, you know, purportedly very skeptical of the Israelis as well, as a lot of American mm. Jews are. Yeah. So, by the way, um, Shireen Shireen Abu uh, Sh Shireen Abu Akale was killed with a 5.56 millimeter armor piercing round fired five okay so five five six from a two. ruger mini 14 rifle yeah that's not a sniper rifle it's i mean 
Well, from Mini 14, no, it's an M4. <laughs> the, the, the rifle was probably an M4 that the IDF had. It's, it wasn't a sniper. It's not a traditional sniper rifle. It's just, it was a small arms exchange. I mean, people, I people use that kind of thing all the time for sniping. You could snipe with any rifle, but you just think this guy, like whoever shot her was like somebody. I mean, he shot her in the head and there's in. no evidence that there was an exchange of gunfire around there. Just read it. Just read it. Go do the homework. Come back. Come back. There we'll was, have a, to there was an back. exchange of gunfire. And, like, why there was no kill? exchange. Okay, there but why exchange. would they kill an Al Jazeera reporter? Because she was reporting things that they didn't like her reporting. Because there's still like she, there's still reporters out there. You could still go and to there are Israel many reporters. Anymore. There was a there was a Palestinian journalist who was killed just the other day. The Israelis don't like them. I can they, imagine they a lot of these attack. things happen in in terms of you know exchanges of fire. It, it, you got again, and you also again, got. To I, I'm going to say this to you again. Like like maybe. You you haven't done homework. Okay, maybe but you, you made it sound you. like the maybe this you chick can't. was like scoped in. No, by she was assassinated. Like, like it's not up for debate. Gamma. It's not up for debate. The DOJ of the United States says she was assassinated. Like this is not a debating topic. Independent reporters have done assessments of it. Independent monitors have done assessments of it. So again, you're just wrong about this. Go do the homework. Come back when you've done the homework. God damn! I feel like I'm in high school again, doing people's homework for them. Jesus Christ. You just claim yeah, it was it's a not, armor It's not, it's not disputed. Like a, it was from an yeah. M4. She was deliberately killed, and it's not disputed. Yeah, but they have to make it that way. They have to make it disputed because the story, each time they've told a lie about what happened there, and then each time they get caught, and then eventually, like, there's a whole process. Like, anyone who's had any experience dealing with the Israelis and the Israeli military know that it's like, they, they just lie at every step along the way until they finally admit it, and then they never actually have to be, pay restitution because things move on. She was killed by a five five six. By four, Patrick five. reads. You're up. Patrick. I, I just wanted. I, you I, can I put a op, you can put optics on any gun, so it doesn't make any sense. You can put a optics on an M4. You can put on optics on an M16. You put optics on a 22. It it's schematics. What you say? Uh, 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 it, 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 exactly. So it yeah. The question was: Was she killed on, illegally or not? Our Justice Department says she was illegally killed. Or at okay, least Patrick. my my Justice Department. I don't know about your Justice Department. I think that's a more open question. Uh, Charles, uh, with the Russian uh, Israeli connection, uh, do you know much about how uh, the Russians supplied uh, Israel uh, arms in 1948? Of course, and of course, yeah. you know who was heavily involved in all of that. Barrier, Leventi Barrier, is that right? Of course, and then of course we also have this other fellow, you might have heard of him, by the name of Robert Maxwell, and all the weapons oh. trafficking that took place from what? what was then Czechoslovakia. Wow, okay, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I visited, his, I visited his grave when I was in Israel. It's quite something. Oh, they found the body, did they? Uh, well, they did find the body eventually, yep. Yeah, right, interesting, yeah. Okay, but, but um, sorry, the, the, the Russian-Israeli thing, that, that goes way, way back. Uh, well, that goes back, I mean, that's your, that's your Solzhenitsyn 200 years together, right? That's your, that's your Jew, the Okhrana, and the Jews being the, the Tsar's secret police, right? Hmm. I mean, this goes back in time, and if you really want to go there, you know, you can go there, but, but people have to do the reading before we can talk intelligently about that. And I have yeah. some books that I would recommend to people, like, like if you read about Sidney Riley, that's a very important figure in this, this sort of history, very, very key figure, a uh, very complicated figure, but very key figure. And you read about the Okhrana generally and the, the role of, basically the role of Jews as the secret police for the Tsar and that kind of complicated relationship between the Jewish secret police and also the kind of fiddler in the roof people living on the pale. Mm, that's very interesting. You have to send me, uh, uh, send me a link on those books. That's uh, a part of history I've never really... Uh... Even considered, yeah, it's the uh, most interesting because there's a direct through line between the Okrana and Ehud Barak and Jeffrey Epstein. There's uh, there's definitely a through line there. Right. The role of disguises, um, the role of hiding, the role of pretending to be Palestinians or Americans or CIA officers, which is a very key part of like the deception techniques that the Mossad uses 
So there, yeah. there's actually quite a lot there if people are curious about it. And of course, it's also yeah. why the Israeli yeah, you state... think you just claim Brent Cooper's husband is Mossad agent just because he doesn't show his fucking face in the photo. I think so, I see somebody's gotten in the, gotten the talking points again. <laughs> you get really I think it's very re- pay. revealing that pay? is it is it a thousand dollars a pound? I mean, what does it work out to like on a weekly basis? Two, two shekels, two shekels. Mm. That's Abby kind of does not, has thing. not yet. I haven't gotten a package of Kazar milkers yet, unfortunately. No. Yeah, yeah. Richard, do you think you get by, Abigail by Shapiro way. on? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, he That's never Ben Shapiro's sister. Yeah, get, yeah, yeah. No, it's not his sister. She is a... just a uh, ghastly oh. singer. Have you ever well, seen these YouTube videos of her singing? They're, they are quite bad. It's actually she like... has terrible tone. It's just unbearable. Well, I've What's only seen thing? her breasts. What's the issue? Oh, I see. Well, it's I, I, just I don't think anyone's a... watching it for the for the for the voice. Well, I, it's unlistenable. I, she, I, she, I, I, she lost the baby, right? She, she was pregnant and then she lost the baby or something, is my understanding. She? Yeah, know. she was like, it's actually, kind of a sad she, thing. She, I, got, she ended up getting a, uh, okay, so she had a miscarriage after she got vaccinated. That's right. Like, Oh, God. You guys are that's such sad. idiots. No, I mean, it is true. Like, empirically, she did get vaccinated and she was talking about being vaccinated and then she had a miscarriage shortly thereafter. Okay. Now, are the two things linked? I don't know. People have miscarriages right. all the time. Right? Yes. So. No, I, I, I'll just rant on her uh, just a little bit. Her tone is terrible. She does sing in tune. She is, the, at least she's not singing out of tune. But her voice is just god-awful, and she makes it worse by this, like, covering or kind of over-singing. So I've seen these things, like, I saw this one video of her, and she was like, oh, I'm going to sing Fan of the Opera, and it's not an opera, y'all. So she's, like, being snobby to boot. But, I mean, did you see that thing in CPAC where she sang the national anthem? She's like, oh, 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 oh. It was pretty bad. It was pretty bad, Richard. Oh, God, yeah, I've actually, I've heard this, and it's, ugh. Richard, could you sing Fantasy but as, Opera? But as you know, as you know, it's a meritocracy. So that's, of course, why she got to sing at CPAC. You know? Dude, she she's more best. popular than Ben just because she has, like, huge tits. And, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah. I mean, it's fucking crazy. Because what happened was, here's what happened, right? So everyone figured out, oh, there's Ben Shapiro's sister. Holy shit. She has some, okay, her face, whatever. But she has huge tits. And then she, she started noticing all these, and she got a lot of traffic and engagement just being Ben Shapiro's sister with big tits. And then she started blocking a lot of the trolls for a while who were like, who were just like making Kazar Milka references and like demanding she like post feed and shit. And then, but she was able to monetize. That's the key part. Cause I know she does, she knows what exactly what she's doing, dude. She, she has this whole like trad wife aesthetic going on with the vlogging shit. She knows what she's doing, dude. Like most of her, you know, most of her fans are just like really horny anti semites, and I, I, I kind of have to give her credit, like respect the hustle for that. To be completely honest, uh, but yeah, I mean, she's she caters to a lot of that weird gamer zoomer audience with the Kazar milkers and stuff like that. I mean, she donated. She come on, she goes on Instagram and posts like, "Hey, ch- hey guys, check out like all these like breast milk donations I'm having. I'm like putting into this little." batch here just you know just because i'm such a you know a charitable woman is because i'm donating my breath i heard that. about that but i thought it was dude, like it's like total bullshit. real dude it's on instagram bro i haven't i didn't know she was even on instagram i just thought it was like horny yeah, she has a block like... on it, but yeah <laughs> i think richard's connection is getting ruined by these uh i think the Mossad has sabotaged richard's connection I think the Mossad loves him. I think it's all the Likudniks who are doing it. For real. I was going to ask, uh, what's after BB Netanyahu? Who's going to be like, what? What's what party is going to like be in charge of Israel after BB Netanyahu leaves? I mean, it's it's, obvi- it's obviously going to be Hunter Biden's wife, right? Who's a Jewess from South Africa? Let's go. Right, Uncle. I mean, are, are oh we yeah, Cohen. Uh, hey, is can anyone? Isn't she Richard not? Spencer? Is, is, is she Richard adopted? Spencer's talking? No, is I, I, Spencer's I, still there. 
his connections. I got a notification. It's bugging. By the way, so the book that everyone should read on this uh, Okrana stuff and the history of it is uh, Sidney Riley, Master Spy by Benny Morris. Highly recommend it. Hey, so you're, you're telling me there were uh, Jews who supported the czar. They worked yes, for him. Absolutely. They worked for him. There you go. Interesting. <laughs> you ever talk about the Straussians by chance? The Leo? Should, I mean, I would love to do a space on like what Leo Strauss was really about. Dude, let's do it, man. I mean, Leo Strauss is one of the most interesting figures of the 20th century, for sure. 